my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangiello, and this is show number 508, and I'm here once again not only to help you have the best experiences when you go to the Disney parks, but I also want to bring you a little bit of that Disney magic wherever you are, not just with the podcast, but with my videos, live video broadcast and chat every Wednesday night on Facebook as well as occasionally from the Disney parks and sometimes from Disney Cruise Line, blog, events, books, audio tours, and more. You can find everything over at www.radio.com. Join me live this week from the Epcot International Festival of the Arts as we wander through Future World and World Showcase, highlighting some of the many offerings in the celebration of the performing, visual, and my favorite, culinary arts. We not only review all there is to see, do, and enjoy, but wander the World Showcase Promenade and sample food and drinks from each of the Festival Marketplace kitchens in our live review. I'll then have the answer to our last Walt Disney World trivia question of the week, and I'll pose a new challenge for your chance to win a Disney prize package. Then stay tuned to the end of the show. I'll have some more information about upcoming Meet of the Month and On the Road event, your voicemails, some additional updates, and more... So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. From January 12th through February 19th, 2018, Epcot is celebrating its second annual International Festival of the Arts, which celebrates the performing, the visual, and of course my favorite, the culinary arts, throughout Future World as well as World Showcase. And this year, it really is bigger and better than ever, with not just more to eat, but a lot more to see, do, explore, and enjoy, whether you come as an individual, with friends, or, I think even more so this year, with your children. So today we are in uh, Epcot Center on a beautiful but a little bit chilly kind of day to uh, do a little bit of a a live walkabout and review of not just some of what you can taste but some of what you can do here. And of course I couldn't do this without some friends and members of the WW Radio Nation. And as always, chivalry is not dead. So ladies first, welcome back again. What? Lisa Donato glasner Hey, happy to be here again. Thanks. (laughs) Uh, Kenneth Johnson. Hi, everybody. And all the way from the great night white north, Mr. Stan Solo. Yes, that's enough about the introductions. Let's go eat. (laughs) See, and this is why we're friends. (laughs) So as I said, this is the um, second year, I believe, that this festival is on. Um, And one thing that we we notice is obviously, you know, Epcot is becoming festival central. It used to really be food and wine and then flower and garden. And now there's festival of the arts. And there seems to always be a, a special reason or a special occasion to come down. And as a... A food enthusiast, which basically means just somebody that likes to eat. Uh, I love having these festivals going on throughout the year. Um, is this something that is an attractor to you guys? Do you guys do you make a special trip out or a special trip down just for some of the, the different festivals? Um, when I wasn't local, I don't know that I would make a special trip down, but it was always something interesting to do. As a local, it's fantastic because it keeps the parks... You know, not that I wouldn't be coming anyway, but it keeps the parks interesting. There's always something new to see here, and um, you know, it's six weeks of festival, and then we've got flower and garden to look forward to, and um, you know, they're they're definitely keeping the offerings interesting throughout the year. Yeah, I'd agree with Lisa on that. I think for me, what I love about it is it makes the parks a little more interesting to those in my family that aren't quite as big of fans of Disney as I am, and it helps me get them out to the parks. Yeah, I could speak as for someone that comes out. Uh, I try to go out once, maybe twice a year. Uh, it is The festival is something that I would look at to see if it's going on when I'm here, and I'll check out things that are happening before I come out. As someone that's coming out you know, less often than I do as a first-time visitor, it's an extra bonus if you just happen to hit it. But honestly, I wouldn't plan my, my vacation around it if it's your first-time visitor because everything is new to you and everything is exciting. But I think it definitely gives you a reason to keep coming back to Epcot, especially if you are a a food person and you know food and wine festival was always my favorite and then i really came to love and and right now flower and garden is my favorite because i think it combines just the right number of marketplace kitchens which is about 13 to 15 the same about this year as well as um things to see and do and i think that's what the festival 
this year really has ramped up in terms of not just passive things to to watch, but actually things to participate in. Uh, the entertainment offerings are um, a lot more. I think again, there's, there's a lot more stuff to take part in. So if you again like the um, food and wine festival in Flower and Garden, you you do get a festival passport when you come in which not only outlines what is going on at the different kiosks, but as well as some of the merchandise and festival experiences that you can do. So they've broken it down and color-coded it so that there is fun for everybody throughout the parks. Um, There's a ton of new photo opportunities where you can sort of insert yourself into um, uh, some classic art. There's Kid Cut Fun Stops. New this year is Chalk Art, Figments Brush with the Masters, as well as an art walk throughout World Showcase and then there's probably 20 or so different festival experiences um, throughout, again, both Future World and World Showcase. Before we get to some of the entertainment, let's talk about some of the things that you can actually do here. Have you guys participated in anything other than just the, the dining aspect? Yeah, I mean, we, I know there are a ton of workshops and seminars. I haven't had the opportunity to do any of those yet because I've been here with my kids when we've been visiting. But um, I think... Uh, there's um, there's a mural that's out each each weekend and throughout the week that you participate in painting. It's a huge paint by number. I think there's been one with a lot of different figments in it when it's finished. There's one that's a very long monorail. Um, so you know that that's been very hands on. Like you said, there's a bunch of um, sort of classic art like the Mona Lisa and the Scream and um, you know Washington Crossing the Potomac that you can kind of get into. And it really does look like you're in the painting, which is cool. Yeah. And then the other thing that I think is cool is a lot of the merchandise is interactive. So there's the Tom's stand where you can have um, your Tom's painted and personalized. There's a scarf area where you can sort of swirl paint and they dip the scarf in and, and make something painted. There's a screen painting t-shirt area. Um, so it, they've, they've really sort of amped up the... the, the um, you know the, the guest participation, not just in the, the the more literal items, but also the merchandise itself. Yeah, and if you look through your um, your times guide, which I think is is super important, it just seems like there's so much more, such a wider variety of things to do. So there's um, there's workshops, including and and when you hear workshops, one of the things I was really surprised at is these switch uh, oftentimes from week to week. So there's an ink and paint animation workshop. Uh, an artisanal spice artistry workshop, watercolor love, floral arranging, whimsical teapots of clay from script to screen, developing stories at Disney Animation Studios, burlap wreath making. There's also an animation academy. But the other thing, too, that um, I think is really attractive this year, and even before we started recording, we were talking about some of these. They have a number of seminars, and these vary throughout the different weeks, which, again, as a local, is a reason to keep coming back. So, for example, they have a Photography 101, Lighting and Perspective, Violin, What It Is and How It Works, Painting Shanghai Disneyland, It's All in the Details, The Art of the Prop and Its Role in the Story, Watermelon Carving, uh, Photography 101, Landscaping, Acrylic in Action, History of American Mavericks, One Little Spark, Finding the Figment Inside of You, which is intriguing, The Art of Face Painting, The Music of John Williams, which we all sort of uh, took note of, The Art of Disney Animation Story and Fundamentals of the Art of Audio Animatronics Animation. All those are included with your admission, too. Like, those are not things normally I I wouldn't wouldn't attend the seminars, but there's probably three or four there that are really attractive to me. And the the thing that I like about it, too, is some of those are not only ways to learn about music and animation and audio animatronics, but they're practical things that you can do. Like the photography one, I think, is really attractive to a lot of people and even to people with kids, too. Yeah, my wife brought our kids to um, an iPhone photography seminar. They really, really loved it. Uh, And it just so happened that my son has taken a photography elective, and a lot of his assignments have to do with, you know, they're supposed to use an iPhone to to do them and uh, we really enjoyed that we also went to a a bronze history of bronze making seminar that was a little more interesting to me than it was maybe to my kids Um, but it it was good and um, yeah so there's a you know and I'm dying to see the John Williams my wife is a musician and she would definitely make it out for that so that's another excuse to get my family in the parks yeah, that's the great thing about the uh, festival is there's a lot of things for... When you hear arts, often people just think, well, it's going to be art. You know, stuff you buy and you hang on your wall. But there's so much more to it. You know, with these seminars, you can... Uh, the photography one is something that was really... Uh, sparked my interest when I first heard about it. 
and then there's also like the the carving and so much more to do than just hang out and look at art yeah you know the other thing i really like about this is it makes art a lot more accessible uh to younger children you know if you were going to take your kids to you know the MoMA or whatever, um, you know, you might keep their interest for an hour or two, but there's so much, you know, the art here, I would say it's, it's, it's very, very accessible. And to that point, if you look again in your Times Guide, there's a Meet the Artist section, and there's probably about 20 different artists. Again, these vary depending on what day, what week that you come here. So you do have a chance to actually um, not just meet, but, but talk with, ask questions to the artists. I know uh, Noah is here every year. He's so incredibly uh, accessible. And, and when you talk with him, he acts like you are the only person on the promenade, which I love because he really gives you a lot of personal attention. Um, so... As somebody with kids, uh, how do your kids find in terms of their level of interest? How old are your kids, and do they enjoy sort of walking around and seeing the art and doing some of the interactive stuff? Um, yeah, so my, my kids are a little bit younger. They're um, seven, and, and my younger son just turned five yesterday. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're not going to be, you know, standing there necessarily, you know, chatting with the artist and, and, and critiquing the art. But at, at their age level, it's it's there and it's accessible. And, you know, there's gorgeous art, you know, that incorporates the Disney characters. And there's gorgeous art that, you know, that's, that's sort of more standalone. Yesterday when we were walking through, there was, you know, an artist sort of, you know, live painting an incredible life-size Darth Vader. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, the, the, the point is so true that, you know, art is accessible on all levels and you don't need to be, you know, staring at, you know, a Botticelli in order to, to, to appreciate what, um, even though you can participate in one and stand on the half shell in this, in this festival, like, you don't, you don't need to be looking at something that's, you know, considered high-level classic art in order to be participating and understanding it. And what's nice about the tents, the pop-up tents, is that they're not uh, galleries where you don't feel like you should dress up and have to go to it. I mean, it is in Disney. And uh, when I was walking around the other day, I asked one of the uh, artists, I said, you know, I really love this, this piece. And it was way out of my price range. There's no way I could ever bring it home. But I asked, is it okay if I take a picture of it? And he says, oh, by all means. He says, we're not a gallery. He says, we're not going to forbid you from taking pictures of it. You know, he knew I wasn't going to go and make a calendar out of it. But at the same time, you know, it was, it was neat that I was able to do that. Yeah, and again, I think what I like about this festival is you can you can make it as interactive as you want with the different seminars, with the workshops, uh, which you do need to book in advance. They run about $39 per person. But there's also, like, fun animation um, academy classes, which are taught by Disney artists. I, I think, Kenneth, you were saying, you know, we've seen artists that we know who are here. Those are included with um, admission. And as we were walking by the... Um, I still want to call it the Centurium. As we were walking by um, uh, Interventions, there was the Art of Disney attraction posters I- inside. Yeah, no, those are those are awesome. They're they're you know inside the the building, and um, if you, you walk through, basically it's it's grouped by attraction, and then it shows you the the poster for each park throughout the world. Um, so you know for the Dumbo ride, you'll see you know in each of the parks and Small World and you know Disneyland and Disney World and the classic the classic posters. Um, you know Tron obviously in Shanghai was really cool to see. Um, you know, and then there's there's even a picture of Walt sort of standing with a very serious look on his face in front of the Disneyland posters that you're looking at, you know, um, you know from from back in the day. So yeah, I, that was one of my favorite things. And you would mention too the Artists of Tomorrow, which is uh, a, a gallery of student arts, which I, I think again lets kids know that, like you said before, you don't have to be. Um, a, they, they can. I think it might inspire them to be a little bit more creative, knowing that maybe their stuff could be on display here too. I think there's a certain power in putting a nice frame on a child's piece of art. I mean, I like to do that with my own children's art at home because it, you know, makes them realize that what they've done is real and is real art. And the kids are amazing. I mean, there's, you know, there's, you know, butterflies drawn by five-year-olds and there's double exposures that are up by 10-year-olds and, you know, some sculpture. And that, the, it's so creative and so beautiful. And, um, yeah, no, that was that the, um, the ride posters and the artists of tomorrow, I think, were my two favorite exhibits to walk through. Yeah, I think just in general, um, you know, the, the Festival of the Arts is a great way to get your kids interested in art, get them interested in creating uh, for themselves, and also exposing them in fun ways to great art. And again, the art, like we said, is not just art that you hang on the wall. Uh, as we were walking in, there was a community arts showcase, so 
There were student um, bands from some local schools that are here. There's um, a lot of performance art, too. The Epcot Living Statues, which remind me of old, you know, Pleasure Island. And then new this year is Art Defying Gravity, which is sort of a, uh, like a mini Cirque du Soleil show um, with, you know, incredibly well... They probably are not eating the same way I am on the, uh, on the promenade, <laughs> considering what, what shape that they're in. And, of course, there's also the Disney on Broadway concert series at the American Gardens Theater, where you'll find... You know, talent that comes directly from Broadway, they'll perform songs from Lion King, Aladdin, Little Mermaid, and Tarzan. Um, have you guys stayed for any of the of the, the evening shows? Yeah? Yeah, I stayed for the uh, one evening show, and uh, I wasn't expecting much, to tell you the truth. Going into it, it was more of as I needed a rest and to sit down. I thoroughly enjoyed that show. It, it was, the singing was like something I've never really even heard before. And I go to a lot of concerts and whatnot with the uh, symphony orchestras, but it was, it was an amazing show for sure. You know, and what I found, too, is when I've come to the festival in the past, um, there are some things that I'll go through and, and I'll make it a point to see. But I also, I think there's something to be said, too, for not necessarily, like, planning your day in Magic Kingdom, just putting the book down and wandering the promenade and experiencing what you just happened to come across. Because there might be a live performance, there might be an artist, there might be something going on. And I think that beauty of uh, the unexpected discovery here is part of what I like about this festival in particular, uh, especially because it is so new and there's a lot of things this year that we haven't seen before. Yeah, I'd say in general that's what I love about Epcot. I tend to plan less here. There are only a few attractions in Future World that my kids make me, uh, you know, go on. But you get more of a sense of being in a park and, you know, having a festival of the arts and being able to just stroll around and experience uh, things that you don't expect. It's 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 a def- definitely a different park experience. One thing I do like, though, about the, the Passport, which has really sort of um, continued to grow, is now this year, in addition to stickers that you can put in for the uh, outdoor kitchens that you conquer, tackle, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. you can actually get um, completion stickers for some of the other um, interactive art stuff. So at least you've been here three, four, seven, eleven times so far. Is that one of the things you're trying to do is, is sort of get that complete passport and complete passport sticker when you're done? Yeah, I mean, I love the way that it's set up where the activities, too, are sort of, you know, either have their checklists or their stickers that you can earn, quote-unquote, um, throughout, not just for... I mean, I, I do love earning my stickers for the, the food booths, but... Um, but no, I mean, it's it, it kind of, it, it tells you what you haven't done yet, and, and, and it makes it fun for the kids, too. They like to kind of flip through and see what we haven't checked off yet. And then, um, I'm sure we'll get to it, but in the back of the book, there are these really cool, um, like, throughout the various countries inside, you'll find, um, like, a, a, it's like a, an etching rub. There's, a, like, a little square, and it tells you... Because, you know, for for Mexico, for example, it, you know, gives you a little bit of history about the skulls and talking about, I think it mentions Coco and you've got the totem poles for Canada. So it it teaches you a little bit about what the, um, that style of art is. There's the kawaii culture, of course, in Japan. And then they let you go through and you do a rubbing on the wall um, to, you know, make your own, um, you know, image of of, of that art in right, right in your passport, which has been fun for the kids. So before we get to the good stuff, which is really why we are here, now that the we, we've timed it just so that the the marketplace kiosks are, are just about to open, is there one thing from a, uh, um, a a visual arts or a performing arts or anything else that's going on, other than the food that you think is a must do or was a favorite of yours or an unexpected surprise? For me, the unexpected surprise was the Broadway show. I was completely blown away by that show, and I definitely want to check out all the attraction posters as well before I leave. Yeah, the attraction posters and the children's art for me were were sort of the two unexpected grabs. I, I wish those attraction posters were for sale because they'd be all over my house. <laughs> they're they're just so cool. Aren't they still for sale? Can't you do print on demand at Art of Disney anymore? I don't I don't know if you can do that with all of them. We'll have to take a look. If not, I in my garage I have every single attraction poster still rolled up. Oh, so wow. check eBay soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think for me one of the things I like is. Um, seeing the artists, not just here in the booths, but so for example, the chalk art, I just think is remarkable. Like they are so incredibly talented. And as somebody who is not artistically inclined, I always feel bad for them because you know that what you're creating is at some point just going to disappear um, as opposed to something that you can sell and hang on somebody's wall. So, um, all right, moving on to, uh, to really the reason why we are here today because the, art, the other arts are just warm-ups for the culinary arts. Um, we've all sort of been 
at least sort of wandered the promenade once before um, so far. Uh, are there things that, <laughs> Lisa's laughing hysterically, she's like only about 11 times. Um, are there things that stuck out to you like, oh, this is a, you don't have to say what it is, but are there things that like you find are, are must-dos? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I can, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, I'll say like, don't, don't miss the Chirashi in Japan. It's, it's so good. Like you even need to say don't miss the Chirashi in Japan. <laughs> All right, so I think what we need to do is I think instead of just talking about the food, I think we really need to experience it firsthand. Um, we can sort of wander our, our way around, discuss what each of the, uh, the different marketplace kitchens has to offer, and decide on the fly what we feel like doing or getting or sharing. Because food is always best when it's uh, shared amongst friends. It's also a good excuse to get everything on the menu and not look like, you know, you're trying to just eat it by yourself. So uh, we are in Mexico. Let's start over in Mexico and take a look at what they have on their menu. Has anybody been to Tried Mexico before? I haven't. So actually, rather than starting in Mexico, we decided to look behind us and step into the old Odyssey Center building, which for years was uh, a standalone restaurant. Now it's really used for special events like this. Uh, here is where you can see they're already um, sitting down for some of the seminars and workshops, which I like is because it's not like in a giant theater. It's in a very small, intimate environment. There's maybe 25, 30 people there. Uh, up to your left is where the attraction poster displays are as well as some merchandise. There's some other art on display as well. But really, the reason why we're here is because this is the Painter's Palette, miniature masterpieces inspired by great works of art. Uh, back this year is the trio of savory croissant donuts. <laughs> Kenneth like, is, is giving like, the fist bump because he's so excited. Uh, I had a chance to try these um, during a, a preview event, and I love these compared to last year. Last year they were... A little hard. It was difficult to eat. And when you bit down, uh, some of the, the filling came out. They very much pay attention to that. This year, they are a lot softer. And there's you get three. Uh, one is filled with a whipped bursin, a garlic and fine herb cheese and fresh herbs. Chicken salad with shaved fennel and fresh herbs. You had me at chicken and fennel. Spicy tuna with wasabi and seaweed salad. That comes in at 9 50 there's also the Gallery Bites, a trio of hors d'oeuvres, uh, grilled shrimp with cucumber cream cheese on a crostini, traditional deviled eggs with candied bacon. I'm so hungry. Crispy truffled risotto ball with truffle aioli, and that comes in at $7. You can also do the pop dart, which is a sort of a pop tart um, shape and flavor uh, sugar cookie. This year they have a strawberry filling as opposed to the Nutella. There's also a white chocolate figment puzzle. And again, for kids and adults too, there's a Mickey and Pluto white chocolate painting or a Festival of the Arts white chocolate painting. Um, do you guys have any of those? So cute. And somewhere there's also a Mary Blair one that is just beautiful. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, it's... Um, it is like it's so pretty you almost don't want to exactly. eat it, but you're going to eat it anyway? Eat it. Right. Yeah. Um, there's also a uh, one, two, three, about six or so different uh, alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages to pair with your food. They have a pomegranate mule, uh, a number of different beers, including a MIA beer company, Jazz IPA, um, a brown ale, and the popcorn pairing flight, which I think, Lisa, you said is a it's a beer flight that pairs with different flavors of popcorn? Yeah, it's cute. It's like the, um, the three small cups of beer, and then on top of each beer is a little napkin filled with the flavored popcorn that complements that beer. So it's fun. Um, yeah, it's like $11 on the menu. Uh, I'm seeing croissant donuts and croissant donuts. Um, so we'll have to get more than one to share because they're, they're small. I know. Share. Sharing is caring. Okay, so we got the trio of savory croissant donuts and the gallery bites, a trio of hors d'oeuvres, uh, which we have found, um, in, depending on your, your cootie tolerance level, is, is not necessarily, um, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to share. But we cut some of the croissant, croissant donuts up. Um, I think we sort of just, just go left to right with the uh, whipped bursin garlic. Uh, you go shy, you go hungry, boys. So, mm. mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. It tastes like a New York bagel. It's like that chewy, it's that chewy, like that I've missed so much from the croissant. And then it's got this just huge, generous, um, bigger than a schmear of the, like the whipped cheese with 
garlic yeah. and I mean bring a mint if you're with a friend um, but it's yeah it, it's so good it reminds me of it, it reminds me of you know breakfast in New York I never thought about it in terms of the bagel but yeah. and I like the the croissant is soft but still crunchy enough as opposed to being too hard like I think it was last year I think it's a highbrow sour cream and onion potato chip. <laughs> it's really good. The, the serving of the cream cheese is the type I'd put on for myself. Yeah. It, there's plenty of cheese on it. Yeah, that's nice. I, I give that a, an easy 10. Uh, next is the chicken salad with shaved fennel and fresh herbs. Dig in, man. Go ahead. Mm. Mm-hmm. What? Right? Mm-hmm. I love fennel. I love fennel. And it's not, um, sometimes chicken salad and, and other salad, if they're too mayonnaise-y, it sort of, it, it, um, it really sort of deadens the flavor. I think this has such a nice little flavor with it and those fresh herbs. Um, I might actually, I'm not sure if I like that one better. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's a close call. But um, again, like I just feel like I'm eating like a really good Jewish deli platter and I'm a sucker for fennel. That was, that was really good. Yeah, I would go with that one. Uh, yeah, for me, it's a par. Uh, they're even. Like, I could eat that as an entire sandwich. Yeah. yeah. No sweat. Um, and let's see how that compares to the spicy tuna with wasabi and seaweed salad. Kenneth, you um, you broke the rules and you ate it while you were inside. What were your thoughts about that one? Uh, I really, you know, it surprised me. I expected it to have a very Japanese flavor profile, given what it is. But I think the there's... there's um, cream cheese as well as the croissant there it almost tastes more french to me than japanese but it's definitely good yeah no i prefer the first two over this one but this is a very good as well refreshing more refreshing yes is, is spicy i think is is um it there's really i mean i didn't get a huge piece of tuna because you guys took the good pieces <laughs> but um it's not it's spicy so much so that it's overpowering. I almost didn't taste a lot of spice at all. Yeah, I'm very sp- spice sensitive, and I didn't get much at all. The seaweed salad, I like a good seaweed salad, but that was very, I mean, it was really good, but it was very, very mild. It almost had a sweetness to it. Yeah. I, I will say, I think we probably ate them in the opposite order. I probably would have started yeah. with the tuna and worked the other way because the you know, the taste potency. And Should we get another one and do it again and yeah. do it the other way? Do it backwards? <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that was that was really, really good. But now, is that one that you would recommend? More importantly, would you come back and get that one again? Um, I think I would definitely get the chicken salad again. And uh, I'm very glad I tried the other two, but I'm not sure I would sit down. So basically, I should come and hang out with you. This way, you eat the chicken salad and I could eat the other two? That would be perfect. Like, I would do this one every time I came. Because I think it's what I like about it is it's very light. It's very, somebody said, it's very refreshing and fresh, too. So, and that comes in, I think we said at, what, $9, nine fifty somewhere. Um, next is the um, the trio of hors d'oeuvres, Gallery Bites. I've had these before. These are uh, a little bit more difficult, possibly, to share. I've seen the way Lisa and uh, Stan butchered the, the first ones. Uh, but you get a small rice ball. Uh, probably about the size of a golf ball, a deviled egg with a huge slab of bacon on it, and a little uh, sort of crostini with two um, really nice size uh, pieces of shrimp on it as well. Um, I love rice balls, um, the, the risotto ball, so it has a little um, ground mustard on the bottom. So boys, go ahead and, and dig in, because I've tasted this one already. I mean, unless you don't want it, and then I'll, I'll eat yours. Go ahead. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was not expecting that. They're very crispy on the outside and so nice on the inside. Definitely something I would... Okay, new favorite, for sure. Absolutely. Did Lisa really cut that into threes? Mm-hmm. And you threw... Okay. I mean, you could have at least made the effort. I mean, give me a little bit of... <laughs> well, you, already, you said you already had it. <laughs> what did you think? I loved it. Loved it. It was it was very good. I'm not I'm sure. I'm sure it was, but you said you'd had it before, so I was. I figured you were taking one for the team. No, that was it was very small, but it was no, that was very tasty. I'm not sure what it was in, what it was sitting like a in, mustard. like a mustard yeah. sauce. That was really really good, and it's warm. It's actually I didn't yeah. expect it to be warm. Mm-hmm. So you guys divvy up the deviled egg and the shrimp again. They're a little bit more difficult to uh, to share. So, and I enjoyed me a good deviled egg. Like when I see yeah. deviled egg, I think homecoming. Um, exactly what I was yeah. thinking. <laughs> the, the homecoming is sort of the gold standard by which this will be judged, but uh, I'm sure it's up to the task. Yeah. What is it? 
Yeah, yeah. Edison, yeah. All right, Kenneth, go ahead. Start, just, just jam your hands in there, man. We're all friends here. Don't be dainty. That a girl. Mmm. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> and it's so good. I love the candy bacon. It's sort of a. It has a sweet finish to the whole thing. Um, delicious deviled egg too. By the way, notice Stan cut this one in fours. Lisa cut the other one in threes. Yeah. There's some <laughs> subtle subtext. Let's get this in three. Mmm. Oh. Isn't that good? That sweet finish to that bacon? It's like a little kiss like goodbye. Oh, yeah, when you said sweet, I was like, oh, how's that going to play against the uh, the devil? Oh, that's really good. I like that. Yeah, it was good. I wasn't getting much candy on the bacon, more smoke, but yeah, no, I think all deviled eggs should have bacon. No. No, it was very Really, shouldn't everything have bacon? I think there's, not, there's not a lot that should not have bacon. And the last one is the. Uh, is there, Stand solo, man. I'm very, that, that's impressive. Impressive knife skills. My old meat yeah, cutting, cutter, meat cutting yeah. job. Were you a meat cutter? I used to be a meat cutter, yeah. So have you noticed how our energy level has increased since we've <laughs> begun recording to, to now? The temperature's, that we're the temperature's also probably up about 10 degrees. Yeah. So. No, I'm a shrimp. I, I'm blaming the food. I, I attribute it to the food. Go ahead, Kenneth. Mm. You did a little, little eye roll there. Like a good eye roll. It's okay. You can talk with your mouthful. Oh, it's so good. It's got a lot of... Garlic? Is that garlic and herbs? Yeah, that's that was very very good. Yeah, both of, both of those plates from the Odyssey are definitely repeat performers. Those really good. And ones that you need a mint for afterwards yes. with the garlic. <laughs> yeah, to place these in order, I'd go uh, rice bowl, rice ball for sure. Mm -hmm. Then the kind of close between the deviled egg and the shrimp. Um, I'm gonna give it to the shrimp. Hmm. I think I would go with the deviled egg first. Oh. Mm. And I like the little rice croquette too. So at seven dollars or seven fifty, would you come back and do this one again? Yes, okay. I'd pay ten dollars if there were three deviled eggs there. All right, so let's do it. Why don't we do it this way? On a scale of one to five, let's do it this way. On a scale of one to five, what would you give the trio of croissant donuts? A scale remember, of now one remember, to five. one to five, five being the best. And remember, be careful how you set the bar because this is just the first place we've gone to. Yeah, it's tough to say it's the first place we've gone to. I would give that a three and a half. Yeah, three and a half sounds good. I mean, I'd give it a, you know, close to a four. I mean, it was it was excellent. I mean, I know there's better out there on the promenade just because there's some more interesting stuff out there. But, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd probably give it a four. Yeah, I'll give it a solid four. I'll give it a solid four. So, uh, And the trio of hors d'oeuvres? Four. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were doing it the other way around. Yeah, no, the other way. Okay, the yeah, trio of hors d'oeuvres, I'd give the three and a half, okay. and then the croissants a four. Same thing. Okay. Yeah, I think I'd probably give the hors d'oeuvres, man, there's so much other stuff. Uh, yeah. A, a good three, a solid three. Three point. Yeah, three. whether you give it a three and a half or a four, it's a good solid yeah. offering, and I would definitely do it again. Yeah. All right, we need to uh, onward and upward because there's so much to eat and so little time. Okay. So in Mexico, El Artista Ambriento, um, there are three different items on the menu. There's the Mixiote de Cordero, which is wrapped slow braised lamb marinated in trace chiles, paste, and spices. Tacos de Puerco, two corn tortillas with slow roasted pork shoulder marinated in ancho paste. Oh, sweet plantain puree garnished with pea tendrils. And the Atole de Fresa and Mexican Contra Bread. It's a warm strawberry drink served with Mexican contra bread. And again, there's a number of different margaritas and uh, beers and water. Uh, out of those three, which sounds the most appealing to you or interesting? Now, I know, Lisa, you've been here, but you ate this, ate this one before. This was not your favorite pavilion? Um, it wasn't my favorite pavilion. I mean, it, it wasn't bad, but, you know, for, for what you're getting and what the other options are out there, it, it wasn't my favorite. The... Um, the braised lamb was was interesting. I mean, if if you're looking for just a you know a, a no carb meat option, um, you know that's there. And then the the pulled pork tacos were were fine as well. We can give them a try. And you said that the the lamb is served like in a, a non edible bag. Yeah, I mean it's you know. Uh, one thing that's consistent throughout all of this is that they really are focusing on presentation. So it's like a it's like a white, almost like a wax paper, or a, it's a, it's a paper like. Um, sort of almost looks like a satchel then it's tied on top so you almost look like a, it looks like a package and then when you open it it's just the meat on the inside so is it worth getting tacos 
Yeah. To me, from the description, merely the description, that's the most interesting offering I see here. Let's do tacos. Let's go. I mean, you can't go wrong with tacos. So here at the Hungry Artist in Mexico, uh, there's two relatively small um, sized tacos. Stan did an amazing job cutting them up. So dig in. Don't be shy. One thing that you can see right off the bat is um, it is very, uh, the meat is very moist. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I was going to say that I didn't taste the plantains, but I caught it at the very end. But there's a sweetness yes. to the meat. There's a sweetness to that to the sauce and the meat. I happen to have, I think, all of the plantain paste in my little piece. <laughs> And it was delicious. It's it's like a uh, a very delicate, almost like an apple flavor. And um, oh, there's a little bit of like heat at the back of my throat yeah, too. The chili paste. Um, I actually thought that was good. I think I got the best bite out of it though, just by luck of the draw. I think I had a lot of the plantains. It's a conspiracy between Stan and Kenneth. So we just watch them how they cut it next time. What do you think? The uh, filling was really good. Uh, the tequila shell itself was a little bit more chewier than I prefer. It was almost uh, like not old, but yeah, not not yeah. It was good though. This was a little bit better than the last time I had it. I caught the plantain a little bit more. The last time I had, it, I couldn't taste it at all. Um, I mean, it's 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 fine. It's not my favorite thing at the festival. I mean, I think for ten bucks, it's a little yeah. I, I mean, I I do look at the price and the portion size, so. Um, you know, it's kind of a stretch for the ten dollars that you're paying for it. Um, it's, I mean, it's yeah, fine. I, I just think you can do better yeah. here. It's not much. Yeah, it's not. It's not, not a great value for the ten dollars. It was like I said. I think it was fine. Yeah. Um, I don't think I would probably not come back. Like I'm now, I'm disappointed that I didn't just try the other one because it was it was different. Um, so I would probably give this a, maybe like a two, yeah, like, a generous two, like a two, two and a half, yeah. two. Yeah. Yeah, two, two and a half. I would give it a, uh, I would give it a three. Well, that's because you got all the plantain. Yeah, of course, I, you're going to give it a three. No wonder why. Stan took care of me. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, then uh, the only way to remedy a two is by moving down the promenade and uh, and seeing what's next. Here at the Painted Panda in China, they have a coconut panda rice cake, crispy fried shrimp, uh, served in a wonton lotus flower, and a crystal moon cake served in a fruit filling with garnished garnished with toasted coconut. Um, Lisa, you've been here before. You said the one that stuck out to you most was the dessert. Yeah, the moon cake was awesome. It's beautiful to look at. It's served with an orchid, and the cake itself is very pretty. Um, and it almost, if you're familiar with Japanese mochi, it almost has that glutinous rice, like, um, and then it's filled. It tastes like, you know, if, if peach pie and a mochi had a baby, that would be this <laughs> this dessert. It's, re- it's really good, and it's not overly sweet. We liked it a lot. So I would love to try that again. All right. We can, we can bounce between sweet and savory. Um, you had, when you said mochi, I, I was already sort of hooked in. Yeah, it's got um, that texture. Can I have a crystal moon cake, please? Moon cake. Mine's going to be So the first thing we noticed when we received our crystal moon cake was, and I think one of you, Lisa, maybe you said earlier, the presentation of the food is beautiful. Um, and this too, it's served on a simple black plate with a lotus flower, but it's a uh, probably the size of a softball, maybe about an inch or so high, wow. and it's filled with fruit and uh, garnished with toasted coconut. You got, I got an audible wow. That is so good. Oh my gosh. I would never have picked it out of a lineup, but it is delicious, and I'm so grateful for Lisa, Lisa suggesting it. It's great. Stan, you talk all Yes, it's um, beautiful looking, for starters, absolutely. And then when you bite into it, it's almost like, kind of like a Play-Doh when you first bite into it. Like, like not the taste, but the texture. How much Play-Doh are you biting into? <laughs> what you would imagine Play-Doh would be like when you bite into it. But yeah, it's uh, an interesting texture for sure. Something that I've never really experienced in my life. Yeah, this is one of my favorite desserts that I've had here. It's it's if you're familiar with mochi, it's definitely that chewy texture, and then there's like a soft peach 
um, actual peach filling. Um, it's probably the most expensive dessert mm-hmm. on the. I think it was nine seventy five, and it may account for the gorgeous orchid that's that's served with it. But I mean, if you're gonna, it's 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 so good. It's, it's so and it's mild. It's got that yeah. slight coconut flavor on the outside. Mm. It's not overly sweet. It actually reminds me so that that. Um, uh, that rice with the coconut is something that I had a lot when I was actually in China. So um, I, I definitely got a sense of authenticity. I was afraid fruit inside, coconut outside, it might be overpowering. It's not at all. Um, even the fruit inside is very, very mild. Like, I would absolutely do that one again. Yeah. And I'm not normally a, a sweet guy. So give me your, your yeah, n- number rating. In terms of uh, sweetness, it's like, it, it's probably not as sweet as the plantain paste and the tacos. I, I really it's don't. What the plantain paste I didn't get to try. It is, it is great. I would give it out of five, a 5.5. 5. Wow, 5.5. Yeah. Wow, 5. Yeah, 5. 5. great. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm up there, four and a half, five. It's, it, like I said, it's probably my favorite dessert on the promenade. Yeah, I'm going to go with a four on this one. It was it was very very good, absolutely. Uh, you know, I almost want to give it a five because again, I'm not normally um, one for the des- desserts here, so I imagine this being at the top or near the top of the list. So I would give it a solid four and a half, even teetering more on the five side. Like I would come back and absolutely get, especially when it's warm out. That would probably be so nice. Um, so that is definitely a uh, that's definitely a winner. But it was also so 30 seconds ago, and we need to move on because we're not even halfway done yet. So just before Germany, as you sort of go clockwise, coming from Future World, is Cuisine Classique, which are braised dishes inspired by classic art of the 18th and 19th centuries. It includes a red wine braised beef short rib with parsnip puree, broccolini, baby tomatoes, and aged balsamic at $7.75. The seared corvina served with braised ratatouille and a lemon thyme beurre blanc at $7.50. A St. Honor tart, caramel cream tart with caramel glaze topped with cream puffs, and the artist palette jumbo chocolate chip cookies. Nobody has tried anything from here yet? What is the one or two or three things? Well, I would say the short rib. Yeah, I've, I've been wanting to try the short rib. Yeah, for the savory, I'd go with the short rib, but that sweet tart with the topped with cream puff sounds interesting well i mean if we have to we might as well all right so we'll do short rib and tart okay good. are you also staring at the corvina is that what you did? <laughs> it is gluten free <laughs> well i like a little gluten in my uh, corvina um okay <laughs> guten tag let's just make all this happen the short rib okay. corvina tart por favor Is this like a dipping? Yeah. What? Wait. It's like a puree. It's a celery root puree. Is that right? So we just need to cut the, oh, the rib. All right. So wait. So before we dig in, a couple of things. No, you. I mean, you can start. You can start cutting. Um, oh, two things. Cut. You didn't even need a knife for that. Look at that. Oh, wow. um, this is a nice way to spend a Monday, isn't it? Yes. And obviously, the pro tip: if you can come into any of the festivals during the week, will absolutely save you so much time and crowds. And I think, and I prefer actually coming during the day yeah. than in the evening, where it's a lot more crowded. The other thing, too, is, Kenneth, you, as we brought these over, you were all sort of commenting again at just the presentation of them, um, just how beautifully presented they are, um, how delicately presented those short ribs are. And then you were going in with your knife, and it just fell apart with your fork. Absolutely. No knife needed. Um, this is just a beautiful day, and this is, I think, the most beautiful food we've seen today. And I think, in general, my impression of the arts festival is it's a lot less crowded than other festivals, and it's uh, really a lot of fun so far. And we've walked by so many of the other booths that have art and artists in it, um, interactive booths as well. Um, Lisa, you said you've you've stopped and done some of the things with your kids, too. So, I mean, we're sort of making a very quick day out of it, but you could really spend an entire day at Epcot not even doing an attraction, just doing festival-related stuff. So you don't have to worry about fast passes and ADRs. Uh, and I like the fact that it, I believe this is incredibly kid-friendly. There's a lot of stuff specifically for kids to do or to do with your family as well. Yeah, my very humble opinion is if you're getting an ADR at Epcot during a festival, my very humble opinion is that you're, you're doing, doing it wrong. It wrong. No, that's the right answer. That's the right answer. All right, so what do you want to dig into first? Um... 
I think we should do the Corvina yeah. first, right? Yeah, All right. Manja. So the Corvina is a nice piece of flaky white fish served on top of a bed of ratatouille. Um, a nice sized piece of fish. Um, again, the four of us are sharing this, having a, a pretty hearty sized forkful. Thoughts? It was delicious. I, I tend not to gravitate to the heavier stuff in Florida heat, but today's a perfect day to be eating it. Um, really healthy portion. The fish was delicious. Yeah, that was that was fantastic. Yeah, okay, I got my new favorite now. Wow. Absolutely. That is amazing. It was. It, it was really delicious. The fish was extremely light. The ratatouille, the tomatoes and the ratatouille, very vibrant flavors. You know, the scene in Ratatouille where the critic tries the ratatouille and he goes back to his childhood? It was kind of like that. It's delicious. So I felt like this was like a comfort food. Yeah. Is exactly what it felt like to me. It had a really nice flavor. It was not too overpowering at all. Because I was eating vegetables, I felt like I was eating healthy. And fish. And fish. What would you? And, and the fish was uh, super flaky, not very fishy at all. Uh, the flavor, it's the flavor of the fish that comes through. It's not laden with any sort of uh, heavy sauces or creams on top. What would you give that? I want to give it a five. I do. Um, I know there's other good stuff coming, and it just depends on what you're in the mood it's a free for. Country. You give it whatever you want. No, I mean I know there's other good stuff coming, but like if you if you're in the mood for some some good solid comfort food, that was that was a solid five. Right, and don't, so don't judge it based on what you think. You know, let it. It has to sort of stand on its own. Yeah. So if it's a five, it's a five. Yeah. I would give it a four just because I'm staring at the short rib right now. <laughs> that's true. No, that's my five. That that was amazing. I could. I'm gonna have a couple more of those later today. I mean, I, there was a lot that I liked about it from the flavor of the fish and, again, sort of that, that sense of the comfort food um, I, I really liked, so I would probably give that a solid four and a half. So now dig into the oh-so-incredibly tender. If we can. And look, I mean, even you dig your fork in it and it falls off. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> I think we're going to have to add a mm-hmm. point to our scale. If we gave that a five, we need I'm going to change my. I'm gonna, okay, I'm changing my opinion. I'm changing my. Um, I, the Corvino just went down to a, a solid four. Yeah. That short rib, that's that's tough to beat. Yeah, if we're if we're working on a five scale, I'm I'm sorry to the Corvino. It's going to have to get bumped because that that braised short rib was. What is this paste? I think it's a celery root puree, right? It Let is me. so tangy. Oh. So you think it's a? Oh. And that, too, has sort of a comfort food yeah. feel it's to like it. A, it's they, almost mm-hmm. sweet, but it's more tangy without sweet. It's it's really, really good. That is that is unreal. Too, yeah, we've got two fives at this table. Yeah. And that little broccoli. I think it is a root vegetable with sorry, some balsamic par- vinegar. It's, so it's a, it's a parsnip puree yeah. with the aged balsamic, so similar to a celery root. It's got yeah. that light. They, they've been using those root vegetable purees a lot, I think, and they're wonderful. They're lighter. Mm-hmm. Um, but they still give you like the creaminess of a mashed potato, but a little bit more of a, it, just a little bit more of a subtle, Very good. subtle lightness. To that's it. lovely. Like yeah, that's you guys keep talking because I'm going to keep digging to the rest of this puree. <laughs> Is this my broccolini? Because I haven't. Have you had it yet? I've, I've had already. I've had mine. I have, but you can have tomato. That's all you, Kenneth. Wow, that's really good. And yeah, that I love that balsamic. I see a little piece of fish here that no one's touching, though. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a tiny little Stan's li- he's licking the, the Corvino plate. <laughs> yep. Oh, my God. Oh. Yeah, you gotta eat I mean, you can you wow. can give them both. If you want to give them both five. Oh, that's for me? Oh, you're yeah, so they're, nice. They're both fives. <laughs> you guys, there's another this, one. <laughs> this is, this is uh, you have to stop here. Yeah. Do we really want to go on and eat more in other places, or we just want to I mean, <laughs> this is a must-do. Yeah. yeah. This absolutely. is def- absolutely a must-do. I almost don't want to have the dessert because I, I like sometimes when you have that, that perfect flavor in your mouth, you just want to let it sit there. Um, but this is the um, the tart, the caramel cream tart with the caramel glaze topped with cream puffs. So take it, use your fingers. Yeah, we, we're all family here. Now this one isn't as easy to this one isn't as easy to cut as the braised ribs was. That's for sure. Hmm. 
I will say, if I wasn't eating anything else, that would be a nice finish to this meal. So especially if you pair it either with the um, the the pale ale, they have two pale ales, a stout, um, a couple, and, and two. Two different types of wines and a beer braising flight, too. I'm not a beer guy, but that, I mean, this right here, if we had sort of, and again, we'll, we'll sort of think back later on, but if you're sort of looking for the perfect marketplace in terms of two home runs and a dessert, this one's going to be really tough to beat. And I know that Japan is still coming. Yeah, I mean, I don't usually go for the super sweet desserts, um, so... I mean, not a natural choice for me, but it's, it's a it's a full on solid sweet dessert. It's, mm-hmm. It was it was very good. It was very good. I like the I like the um, the dark chocolate and the sweetness of the caramel. Mm-hmm. Um, I would give that I'd give that three and a half. Yeah, <coughs> about a three, three, three and a half. Yeah, it's a little bit sweeter than I prefer, but yeah, I'm, I'm gonna give you a four. Yeah, I would I would liken it to like an eclair. It's yeah. got a really nice flaky pastry. Um, crust and the chocolate I would, I would give it a three yeah okay. this is um, this is a winner this is cuisine classique like it's going to get a special gold star in the book um, but we're still not at the halfway point so saddle up you can hear from the music in the background that uh, we have reached the motherland and it's L- l'art di mangiare it's baroque inspired dishes that celebrate the art of eating with dramatic flavors and rich colors. Um, everything on the menu, I cannot pronounce, although I am Italian and took two years of Italian. It's involtini, uh, whatever. It's a basil scented salmon roulade with purple rice and romesco sauce. That comes in at $12. This formato is uh, tomato and eggplant terrine with a fior di latte mozzarella. And the uh, crema fritta is cream fritters with peach and arugula pesto with amarena cherries. That comes in at $9. So there's the salmon roulade, the tomato and eggplant terrine, and or the cream fritters. Anything? Uh... Um, yeah. and, and if we, we don't have to hit every kiosk if, if there's nothing that's... I'm trying to look and see like if anybody else is walking out with it to see what it looks like. Yeah. Thoughts? Hard I'm just seeing everyone with alcohol alcohol walking just, away. Yeah, so there's the uh, Amaretto Bellini at $12, the Vodka Rossini, which is vodka, strawberry puree, and Prosecco. You could also get Prosecco, Moscato, uh, Corbinillo, uh, Pinot Grigio. So a lot of different uh, beverages here at sort of the, uh, the halfway point. Stan, is there anything on the menu that is immediately jumping out to you? I'm trying to wrap my tongue around these Italian <laughs> words, to tell you the truth. Like, yeah. If anything, it would be the, the first one. The salmon? Yeah. Being a fish guy. I'd be happy to try the first or second. Yeah, I would too, except that I'm kind of saving myself for the uh, Paul Bocuse salmon yeah. in France. That's true. And we and we know, like, I can see, I can almost yeah. hear Japan call him. We can skip this one. That's okay. Um, I would love to hear from anybody. You know what? This is reason to come back. Yeah. This is, we'll, we'll come back and do part two at some point. And that's, a great, and that's a great thing about the festival is you don't have to hit every single one. You, you can't. I mean, you just can't do it. Or yeah. else you're going to look like me. Yes, exactly. Or me. <laughs> so as we walked by, we just saw that there was the Scream and Mona Lisa, um, the, these sort of vignettes that you can put yourself into where they have photo pass photographers. Uh, I think these are so neat. They, they are so much fun, um, and I see them shared on social all the time. I've seen you do them with your kids. Yeah, we did them with the kids. Um, yeah, they're just super fun, and they're, they look so real. The way that they have the, I guess, the perspective set up with the Scream and Mona Lisa and the Venus on a Half Shell. Um, yeah, they're they're really really fun. Have you seen my Venus? It's it's, it's breathtaking. It's spectacular. <laughs> okay, deep breaths. Deep breaths. We are at the Takumi table. Whimsical dishes crafted by Japanese artisans. Chirashi, let me say this nice and slowly. Chirashi sushi with haupia pearl, which is sama, salmon, tuna, and yuzu miso with a coconut tapioca pudding. And there's a taiyaki dessert, which is Japanese stuffed pastry with sweet, oh, I like red bean, yeah. sesame cream, and raspberry sauce. There's also a, um, a beverage, which is a Kalpiko yogurt strawberry swirl sake 
a masusaki in a personal a what a personalized wooden cup shut up i just want to see this cup uh, oh it's one of the little boxes put your name on it yes i'm thinking maybe we should just well maybe we're obviously getting everything. We may not finish the recording, but... Yeah. Um, it's about to get a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we have to... Okay. Hi. Can I have a uh, Tarashi, please? Sushi. 750, please. Oh, I'm not done yet. A, um, a Taiyaki? Taiyaki. And if I get the cup, would you try the sake? Sure. And a sake, please. One sake. In the in the cute little box, okay. yeah. <laughs> and twenty two dollars. <laughs> I got though. All right, I'm gonna need a minute just to sort of take. I, I think far and away, this is the most beautifully presented of the dishes. Um, you know, if you are a a Japanese or or sushi connoisseur, you know that the presentation is so important because you do you start your meal with your eyes and your, your your olfactory senses even before you actually taste the food. We were commenting about how the, the Tarashi Sushi is served on, it almost looks like a piece of slate. Um, the, the presentation is like, we were all sort of commenting like, we want to take this home because it is so well done. It almost doesn't look like it's a um, disposable. disposable, yeah, disposable item. So the way it's presented is there are two slices of orange and a bed of um, sushi rice, probably about um, a little bit smaller than baseball size, and it is topped with um, salmon and tuna, and it looks like some seaweed salad, and a, a yuzu miso. Um, I am super excited for this one. You've had this one before, and this... Yeah, it's my favorite thing here, so I'm super excited to get your response to it. And the little cup of, um, I guess it's like a coconut milk with tapioca and fruit that's next to it is so good. So we'll definitely have to share that. Um, so you yeah. actually get this one. You actually get a dessert with the entree. Yeah. This sort of tapioca, the coconut yeah. tapioca pudding on the side comes with it. I mean, yeah. we obviously got everything on the menu. So, um, and then, <laughs> right, and the um, the taiyaki uh, stuffed pastry is actually in the shape of. A fish, and there's, we've seen this in a couple That's other places. I say, so you've lived in Japan, so this is something that is you would recognize from Japan? Yeah, so the taiyaki is, has been around for a long time, this like fish shaped dough that's filled with. It often like here that sweet azuki bean or red bean paste um, and they've got it served with um, a, a pretty potent from when I tried it I'll hear you curious to hear your thoughts um, sesame paste and then the the cream and raspberry um, yeah so let's we got to dig in here you know I think the crowds are getting big why don't you guys move down to the next kiosk I'll take care of this <laughs> um, dig in okay. mm. oh you know what it is it's that yuzu yuzu miso glaze mm-hmm. that really gives it such a nice flavor yeah you can see it right in there that's delicious and you're right laying it atop the the, the oranges adds just a little bit of citrus to it what do you think of that that stands for a little now I'm not a sushi guy then stop then move your chopsticks out of the way but I was very curious to try this and I, I, for people that are afraid of trying sushi this is something that you could try and you'll enjoy right and it's not spicy or, or anything else like that there's no sort of intense flavors here sushi is actually one of my favorite foods and um i would put this right up there with some of the most interesting taste experiences i've had it's really really good i like that a lot uh, if you guys don't dig in i'm just going to finish it so what would you rate this this one gets a easy five for me five yeah, no, I'm going to go with a four on this one, yeah. just because I'm really not a sushi person. But it is, if, you, if you're afraid of trying sushi, this is a place to try it. Yeah, it, it's it, it's an easy five for not just for flavor, but for presentation. And the fact that you also get this coconut tapioca pudding, which none of us have tried as yet. So I'm not going to be shy. It's a little coconut tapioca pudding that also has um, pieces of, looks like, pineapple and... Blueberry and strawberry. Oh. Oh, my. Stan, you're not going to like that. Kenneth, don't even bother. That's that's delicious. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a tough thing to split four ways. I mean, you almost want to take it like a shot at the end of your chirashi if you're eating it alone. But it's so mild, and I mean, this is it's it's a it's a very light lunch in itself. Just this one plate. Uh, what was the price point on this one? This was so this one was only seven fifty. So I thought this was more than that. So I think this is a I think again compared to some of the other ones, yeah, value wise, absolutely, hands down. Like the this is so good. When you look at like those. The tacos were like ten, and this is mm-hmm. seven fifty. I mean, this is this is way better. Yeah, it's I think fantastic. We've got like a piece of tuna there too. We're trying to, yeah, you eat it, you eat uh, it. And I love it on the oranges. Mm-hmm. Like it's the it adds like the most subtle, but definitely they are pop of citrus at the base of the rice. And if you try underneath the um, the tapioca pudding, there's like a sweet citrusy, almost like a, a glaze underneath there. That's easy, easy five. Yeah, easy five. That's, That's a lick of plate. Huh? Citrus. <laughs> yeah. You get a plate. And right, you could, you literally could, you could eat everything on the plate and then lick it and just put it in your bag. Oh, this is really good. Why doesn't somebody taste that sake? Twist the arm <laughs> yeah. in the name of science. Has your name on it, but literally has your name yeah. on it. It's phenomenal. It's very mild. It's served in a in a, like a lovely little oak. Um, you know, traditional wooden wooden cup um, that's you know bringing out that that flavor a lot, and it's cool. They actually take a sharpie and we'll put your name in Japanese. So we've got we've got Lou written here in Japanese on the side of the, the the cup for him to take home. So I have I actually have one of these that I got from Morimoto when it first opened, and they told me that the more you use the the box the more uh, it sort of uh, um, intensifies the flavor of the sake because it's sort of absorbed into the wood like the same way you would like in a, in a wood barrel. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of the, my, you know, my Italian great-grandfather and his pasta, to, you know, pasta sauce pot that he never washed, you know, because it, it added to the flavor over the, the decades. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's a mild, it's, oh, yeah. it's a really nice, really nice sake. So it's super smooth. Has a nice finish. There's no sort of intense flavor. Um, for somebody who's never tried sake before, uh, who might be afraid of it, <laughs> so it stands ever done it before. No, this is my first time ever trying sake, and uh, yeah, it's a lot more smooth and more mild than I was expecting it to be. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if all sake's like that or just this type. Yeah, they vary obviously in intensity and flavor and color. I love the. Um, Nagori like the the cloudy, the unfiltered sake. Um, I just think that's wonderful. But this is, like you said, it's very, very mild. It's not strong at all. It's a crowd pleaser sake. I mean, it's it's very good. It's mild. It's smooth. It's um, accessible. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very accessible. I think, you know, if you've never had sake before and you want to say that you've tried sake, this is definitely definitely a good a good bet. Plus, you'll bring a, a personalized cup home. Yeah, like you can keep everything, even the little the plate for the uh, for the other dessert. The taiyaki, the, again, the, this Japanese stuffed pastries. Maybe just try and break that apart or cut it apart. But it is. It's. It's. And I'll post photos in the show notes and on Facebook. But it's the, the sesame is potent. So I just it's just a personal experience with having tasted it. The sesame paste that comes with is very very strong. So it's good. But I, I wouldn't let your fish fall into it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. I like this one. You guys keep doing that, and I'll attack the tapioca. Because this is, it's not super sweet at all. I really like this, and I'm tempted, because since nobody else is going to do it, too. You get a little bit of the sesame on there if you want. Mm. Those little baby tapioca pearls are just phenomenal. With the dessert, you get a generous dollop of whipping cream in it, which is that really adds to it. Yeah, I really like this. Yeah. It yeah. it definitely stacks up even to the uh, rice cake in China. It's mm. delicious. So I love red bean. Uh, like I love like a really nice red bean mochi. Yeah, man. I want to do it just the way whoever intended. Mm, yeah, it's better with the. Oh my. Better with the sesame. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm a southerner, and I'm very hard to please with desserts because, 
in my opinion, we have the best on the planet, but that is really, really good. Mm -hmm. Because the sesame, there's a, a savory aspect to it, and it's warm inside. I wasn't expecting it to be warm. Oh, I really like that a lot. And I had the I had the tail end of the fish, and there was filling right to the end of the tail, the tip of the tail, which is which is nice. And it's a big piece. I was gonna say a big piece of fish. It's a big pastry, so again, it is very shareable. Um, and that comes in at that's four fifty. Yeah. 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 I give this five across the board for presentation, taste, value. Top to bottom, the hands down. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is my I, the favorite. I, there are a lot of stands I haven't been to, but this has been my favorite consistently. We're going to rectify that first part today, but yeah. yeah, I would agree, Lou. I think this overall for everything that's presented here, the value, everything, probably the best booth so far. Yeah. Yeah. Presentation is definitely a five on this one. It's the, it's the most beautiful one we've come across. Um, I'm not, a, like I said, I'm not too much of a sushi person, so I can't, it's hard for me to give that one a five. But the dessert the, between the coconut pearl tapioca and the uh, fish pastry, those are, those are amazing. And we were sort of saying half jokingly, like, you know, even the plate that it comes on, you almost want to, you know, throw it in your bag and, and collect. Yeah. It was the same thing during um, the holidays, the holidays the when they had the bowl of meat, like, yeah. you could have brought them home and, and so served them at home. Yeah, that soba oh, bowl, when they soba, would give it to so you, good. like, it... it it was in the evening, so we weren't getting, like, a bright light view of it. But it was like, you're giving me this to take home? <laughs> I don't understand. And it's the same with these dishes. They really, they they put a lot of thought into presentation, obviously. Japan, I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a staple of, of Japanese cuisine. But, I, yeah. but Japan consistently um, has had excellent offerings at all the festivals. Okay. Um, yeah, easy, easy fives. Just, that's all you. Just get to finish it. Easy fives across the board. Uh, and by the way, you can, if you want the sake cup, you can buy it. I think it's just, I think it's $6. Yeah, if you want to get it and they'll put your name on it. So um, if you want that to take home as a souvenir, that's what, oh, yeah, big time. This is like the, this, this coconut tapioca pearl that's on the side of the chirashi. Such an unexpected bonus. Uh, yeah. bonus. Like it's, it, it's a full light lunch right there. Easy. Yeah. And it's not overly sweet. No, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, especially with the chocolates and the sauces and the, the, the creams and stuff could be sweet. That's, that's the, per that right there is the perfect trifecta. Easy. All right, we're done. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel bad for Morocco next because the bar is set incredibly high at this yes, point. It is. I could easily do that again. Mosaic Canteen, you're like in the Friday night 8 o'clock spot because this is really tough trying to follow Japan if you're going clockwise. Uh, this is a colorful feast inspired by Moroccan mosaics. There's a hummus trifle, which is layered hummus topped with spice, spiced beef, pine nuts, and dried cherries with pita chips at $9. The Mediterranean flatbread with za'atar, olive oil, artichoke, olives, mozzarella, and feta cheese. And chabakia, which is hand-twisted strips of fried dough coated with honey, rose water, and sesame seeds. And there's an Embrace the Arak. Sounds like something from Indiana Jones. It's Masaya Arak orange juice and grenadine. That is $8. Has anybody tried any of these? Yes? Yeah, I've had all of these. Um, How many times have you been here? <laughs> <laughs> I like to knock out a slate when I come. Um, no, I, the, the flatbread was, was, was good and fresh if we wanted to try that. Um, the hummus trifle was good, but uh, more just like a more hummus. It was okay. less less to, to talk about. And the chebakia, I mean, it's traditional sort of Moroccan style, that sweet honey coated, a little, a little sweet for my taste, probably for you guys as well. Um, we can try the flatbread if you want. So because we've, we've passed the halfway point, we've hit a couple of big high points. We know that France is still coming up, which has some really nice stuff on it. Do you want to potentially get yourself full on flat, flatbread, or do we bypass it? We're getting a bypass. We're getting nods from everybody. Mm -hmm. And Lisa says it, it's good, but it's okay to pass on this one. It's it's tasty. It's a solid lunch, but you know, it's, if we're trying to figure out things that are you know fun to talk about, yeah. You know, and I I know we've got a lot coming in France, so. Or we could just go back to Japan and just hit that one all over again. Absolutely fine with me. <laughs> So here's a question as we walk through Morocco. 
Uh, have you eaten at any or all of these restaurants? All. All? Yeah. Thoughts? I love the Spice Road table. The lamb sausage there is one of my favorite dishes in all of Epcot. I, I could eat it every day. Wow. What about you, Stan? Of the regular Morocco restaurants? Yep. I've done the quick service ones. Okay. I probably had the entire menu at one point or another. We've done them all. Uh, Marrakesh was a lot of fun with the belly dancers. Tangerine Cafe is um, up there with my top quick services on property. Um, and, uh, the, yeah, the, the chicken shawarma platter and the actually, surprisingly, the vegetarian platter at Tangerine Cafe are two of my favorites on property. And it's just a gorgeous pavilion. Yeah. Uh, a spice road table, um, I've only been here for appetizers. Again, I, I love this location, again, for being on the water. But I think that Tangerine Cafe is not only one of the most flavorful quick service, not just in Epcot, but anywhere, but I also think it's an incredible value, too. Uh, for $11, $12, you get, I call it the Avengers platter. I get the shawarma with the, uh, the chicken and the lamb. You get so much food in there. Um, and it's, it's flavorful without being scary at all. It's really delicious. And I, I like Mediterranean food. It's one of my other favorite cuisines in all the world. Um, and they do it really well here. It's a fun place to grab a table, too. You can kind of get a little nook and cranny spot you know, you know, where the incense is burning in the back. And it's, it's a nice place to sit down with a good plate of food. And again, as we're walking by, the, I love seeing all the different uh, styles of art from the artists here, as well as the different festival merchandise. Another thing. Bell, bell, hot, call me. <laughs> Another thing that's fun is they've got, with the different character greetings, they've got a piece of art of the character that's got a little story behind it. Like here, there's a, there's a portrait of Belle that um, has been done by a machine that her father rigged up, is the storyline behind it. So those are new for this festival. So before I even get into France, I'm going to start off with an apology, because I am pretty much guaranteed to butcher every part of the French language, including the name of this marketplace, which is L'Art de la Cuisine Française, decorative dishes inspired by the fine art of French cooking. There are three items on the menu and five, four beverage items. There's... Does anybody speak for anybody? Help me out here. Uh, roulettes. Do you, there's house-made pork roulettes, cornichons, and house-made bread at 875. A salmon in a puff pastry crust Paul Bocuse style with spinach and Bure Blanc sauce at $10 and a sunset mango and raspberry cake, Les Couchers de Soleil. All right, not bad. Which I've had all these and they're awesome. That, again, not being a sweet guy, that sunset mango and raspberry cake is really a piece of art, but it's so light and so fluffy. Like me, I mean, I'm heavy and fluffy, but do you understand the, the point? Uh, there's also the frozen... Um, cocktails with great with gray goose vodka and peach puree as well as a french sparkling chardonnay so as you look through the menu uh quickly going to google translate to figure out what it all is what is, if anything have any, has anybody tried anything here yet i haven't had any of it um i know you tried them all um the other day i haven't had any so i'm i'm open to trying anything i'm, I'm also a big fan of the frosé if anybody wants to get a, a good drink on a hot day the salmon and puff pastry screaming try me just from looking at the picture yeah, me too. I'm a big fan of Paul Bocuse and his history here with Epcot. And, uh, you know, especially now that he just died a week or so ago, it's uh, kind of nostalgic for me to try that. So we really should have it sort of in tribute to Paul yeah, Absolutely. Tisha. So why don't we do the salmon and the frosé? Okay. Then that'll give us some, we'll still leave a little bit of room in what's left in our bellies for the, uh, the last few kiosks along the way. Nice Bonjour. Okay, how do you pronounce salmon? A salmon croûte. Salmon en croûte. Okay, one of those, please, and a frosé. I've got straws. So we just realized that we uh, inadvertently, in our excitement to get to Japan, we blew right by the American Adventure and the artist table that had the roasted pork roulade as the pan-seared scallop and the Artist Palette Jumbo Chocolate Chip Cookie. Uh, I did, haven't had a chance to sample them all. Um, I really liked the pan-seared salad with the chorizo, the red pep the roasted red pepper coulis, and the Parmesan crisp, which is also gluten-free, by the way. Um, the roasted pork was really good. had a nice um, crisp outside. It was fatty in, in a good way, because that's a lot where all of 
the sweetness came from. But we have moved on to France where we have our salmon in a puff pastry crust and the uh, the frosé, which is the uh, rosé wine with Grey Goose vodka and peach puree, which we really just got for Lisa. Um, <laughs> so first things first, presentation. Five on presentation. It looks great. Really, I thought the presentation was a bit lacking after the uh, presentations that we have come across earlier. Yeah, it's at the bar. I mean, I, I like the fact that it's not just a round puff pastry. The puff pastry is actually shaped like a little fish. Uh, but go ahead. Go, go dig in. I've had this before, but I don't want to taint anybody's opinion, so. Ooh. It's a lot of food. I don't, I don't, didn't notice what the, I don't remember what the price was on it, but it's a, it's, I'm especially noticing because we're cutting things into fours, mm-hmm. um, that, that we each still have a good few bites worth of food here. This was $10. Okay. But you're right, and, and again, especially for a piece of fish, it is a, um, it's a large portion. Much more shareable than some of the things we've come across. Mm. Wow. Mm. The sauce makes it. The sauce definitely makes that. That is delicious. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Really good. It's really, really good. The the, The sauce that it's sitting in is really good. It's like a flaky, really nice flaky crust with the salmon on the salmon on the inside is not not fishy at all. It almost tastes like a, it tastes like a comfort food. Like it almost tastes like a salmon pot pie mm-hmm. or something when you get it all in your mouth at once. The thing that surprised me is the amount of salmon. Mm-hmm. Like it's a really big, nice. it's a thick piece, piece of salmon. salmon but mm-hmm. the, and what about salmon too? Like a lot of fish, if you overcook it, it gets very, very dry, very, very hard um, in terms of texture. But I think that's cooked very well, and that butteriness of the pastry, again with the accent of that. Um, sauce underneath um i like yeah i like that yeah if you're listening at home mark this one down you got to try this one it was better than cats i would see it again (laughs) and again (laughs) (coughs) better than cats uh what would you give it um it you know it gets harder and harder to rate it to rate as we go i mean I i think it's a solid four i would say I'm going to go five on that one. It's right up there with the short. Yeah, I'm doing a four and a half. Based on the presentation, it was, while it's nice, just didn't wow me like the, some of the other the Japanese ones have and the Chinese. I think I give it a four in terms of um, the amount of food that you get. Uh, I think the quality of the fish there is excellent. Um, just going to eat the eyeball. That's all you. All right. That's all you. Tell us what it is. And so how is your uh, little frozen frosé? Um, it's not just mine. We've <laughs> many straws here. This is the rosé wine with Grey Goose vodka and peach puree, different than what is normally served on the uh, on the promenade in the in the um, the, the the wine and. Yeah. It's so good. It's so light and refreshing. It's a great meal to have. It's a great drink to have on a hot day here. But you know, even on a chilly day like today, it's still good. Um, standing here by the water, it's a, it's a great drink. And it's a decent serving, like for you know, as as you know, as and drinks and prices going. Some of the some of the price drinks are astronomical here. I think the there's the margaritas in Mexico are, you know, thirteen fourteen dollars each. Um, and this one isn't nearly as much, and it's it's a good drink. I like I, it. It's it, it's a nice grab and go for me. Yeah, it's sweet without being overly sweet um, to the point that you can only have a few sips and then it, it becomes undrinkable. I don't like things that are are too sweet that way. I think that is a nice complement to the rich butteriness and the creaminess of the puff, pa- puff pastry and the sauce. So and it's, a, it's a French rosé. I mean, some people hear rosé and they think they're going to be drinking like white Zinfandel. <laughs> um, it's it's not. It's a it's a it's a true rosé. One to five. I mean, as as drinks go, it's up there with my fives. I think um, it's a drink. You know, it's but it's it's very good. So over. So give me the the French. Uh, oh, oh, we didn't get the dessert. Mm. Newman. Um, overall, what would you give France? Well, based on what I had, um, I would love to have a, a glass of Sancerre with this salmon uh, instead of that drink. I, I don't drink a whole lot of liquor, but I would give France a solid four. I don't know what his fancy French accent in Sancerre. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that is. But. 
Yeah, no, the the, the, uh, the drink is really well. Well, I'm giving that drink a five. I'm I'm going to give it a four and a half on France overall. I'll also say it's a pleasure to eat France this time of year. I was saying to Kenneth that you know it's it's very very rare that I crave either France or Italy. It's food stirring, food and wine, or flower and garden. Because in the Florida heat, I just don't like to eat heavy foods yeah. like that. Um, but you know this this time of year, it's nice to be. You know, to have the, the, the cool breeze and, and be able to, to to want the French food. Yeah, this is this is uh, now that the weather is warmed up. It's a it's a perfect day for this. So, so we're giving the um, we're giving the puff pastry a four, and so we're giving overall four four and a half for France. For France. Yeah. All right. So grab your uh, frosé to go, and we will make our way to the last few kiosks. So we just went and made our way to the Masterpiece Kitchen, which is located just past Canada. Interestingly enough, there was nothing in between France and beyond Canada, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I particularly like these, and I call it sort of a smaller culinary festivals, as opposed to the 30 marketplace kitchens that are out for food and wine. I think the quality of the portions, uh, the quality of the food is better. I think the portion sizes are bigger. Certainly the presentation is on a much different level. Um, And even the crowds are are much different too. Uh, But here, these are artistically plated dishes. Again, presentation first. We're we're devouring with our eyes before we do with with our palate. Um, These feature the world's finest masterpiece ingredients. So there's a smoked salmon tartare with caviar, crisp focaccia, and traditional accompaniment at $12. The vegetarian wild mushroom risotto with aged Parmesan truffle shavings and Zinfandel reductions. Charcuterie palate with artisan cured... You're making all kinds of yummy sounds over there. Uh, cured meats and cheeses uh, featuring applewood smoked beef. And a triple chocolate mousse uh, with chocolate crunch, dark chocolate sauce, and gold leaf from Master Pastry Chef, which looks like a, um, a, a giant pyramid. Um, and again, a number of different um, champagnes. There's a classic sidecar with a chocolate twist. There's a handprint Merlot and a number of other wines as well. Uh, as we were first approaching this, what were some of the things that were jumping out at you other than everything? Wow. You know, I... You can say everything. The risotto caught my eye, but then you directed my attention to the tartar, so... Yeah, it's it's really tough. They all look delicious, and gosh, it's going to be hard to choose. I mean, everything on this list looks phenomenal. That I know you've had the tartare, but that the the ingredients in that look amazing, and it's beautiful in the picture. I, I'm almost leaning towards getting the tartare because we've had multiple yeah. salmons. We need to sort of compare salmon to salmon to salmon. What about you? I'm really eyeing up that mushroom risotto. And what is nice about this booth is it does have the color pictures. Yeah. So we can actually see what it looks like before we order. So I think we need to get the salmon tartare to compare the salmons. And I think we need to get the mushroom risotto to compare. I think that's the comfort food version for this um, for this. Yeah, I would say the charcuterie looks delicious too. But, you know, it is a charcuterie plate. If you've had one, you kind of know what to expect there. I think these other two dishes would really show us what this booth is about. You've had charcuterie here? Um, I've, I've not had it here, and I, I mean, it looks wonderful, but, you know, like Kenneth said, it's it, it, probably less to talk about. It looks sort of more straightforward. So, no, I think the risotto and the tartare would be would be a great sample here. Sweet. So it's interesting, as we were served our plates, the first things I heard were I can already smell, the, you can already smell the truffles, and uh, was it you who just said it was the caviar that, that got you? Yeah, Yeah, the caviar and the tartare, um, yeah, look, that looks so good, it looks really good. Once again, presentation is beautiful, uh, we're, we're, we're all commenting, though, that we're, the, the plates are just sort of very basic square plates, because I think we think Japan raised the bar so very high. Um, portion size for the salmon, to me, it's like... Lou Mangello bite size, like I, I can almost do that in a single bite, but it's also served with a um, a thin crisp focaccia and a couple of slices of um, boiled egg. A healthy portion of caviar. Yeah. There's a very healthy portion of caviar sitting on top, also. So, 
Yeah. So I think we should just dig in. Inside Don't... the boiled egg, is that like a radish with some olive paste or something? What is in the onion? onion? I think you should try it. I will. Mmm. Yeah, it's olive paste okay. and onion, and it is delicious. Three of them. Spicy. Put it on the focaccia, do you think? So that might be an idea, yeah, let's try that. You can take a little caviar, it's okay. <laughs> I have to twist my arm. Go ahead, Kevin. Now we're comparing salmon to salmon on this one, okay. right? Yep. Let's see. That is good salmon. And you come from the land of salmon, so you should know. This is a, this is a smoked salmon, so very yeah. different, obviously, yeah. than... It tastes like lox. Yes, <laughs> yes, it does. Um, if we're comparing, I think my favorite salmon of the day, though, is still the Paul Bocuse tart. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to concur with that, yeah. I'd agree. I mean, this is very good, but, you know, it definitely tastes like... You know, it's, it's it's a lox. The caviar is really, really good. The focaccia that's with is good. I haven't had this egg yet. So. The egg is delicious. The olive paste, I really like. So. That, that onion is very acidic, and it burns a little bit, but it's it's a good kind of burn. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It hovers in my mouth. So, yeah, I mean, I think on its own, it's fine. It's a, it's a nice quality of salmon. It has a nice flavor to it. <laughs> a little hot, a little spicy. <laughs> Um, but I think you're right. If I was to, if I had to pick a salmon dish, this is really light, though. Mm-hmm. It's really, really it's, light. It's very good. I mean, it's good. The caviar is good. They, um, there is no subtlety in that egg, onion, and olive paste on the side. I'm gonna need a mint. What, um, what hit you with that? Was it the onion? The onion and the olive. Yeah, the 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 top. I guess it's like a it's a very finely ground tapenade or something. It's it's. The very potent olive taste. I love olives, um, but then sitting in that 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 very strong onion. I don't know why the onion's red. I don't know if it's dyed or it doesn't taste like it's pickled. Um, but yeah, that's that's potent. Yeah. <laughs> so on a one to five scale, I'd give that a three and a half, four. Yeah, I'm going four on this one. Three. Yeah, I, I would give it a three. Again, just on its own, not even comparing. Um, it gets bonus points on the present. It gets bonus points on the presentation. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, um, I'm still eating it, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's I, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, it's, it's a small portion. But obviously, we all had, you know, a couple of forkfuls of it. Um, but let's get to the heart of the matter, because I think I did it in a very deliberate order. Because this risotto with that wonderful shaved Parmesan and the truffles on top just looks so good. I'm not even going to be shy. Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, you can taste the Zinfandel reduction and the truffles. That's what makes it to me. My mouth is forgiving me for the onion. It's, <laughs> it's That's wonderful. It's really creamy. It's not overly heavy. The truffle and Parmesan on top is great. I assume that's a shaved Parmesan. Mm-hmm. It's really, really good. Keep talking so I can eat more. This would, I could have this for dessert, really. Well, it's not getting crazy. <laughs> it's a savory dessert. Mm. Like a rice pudding. Like a rice pudding, yeah. Now, this is a vegetarian dish, right? Mm-hmm. So, I so, don't know if it's vegan, but at least it's, it um, wouldn't be vegan with the cheese. Mm. Yeah. It's creamy, and you get that nice little bit of that sharpness from the Parmesan, and the truffles are phenomenal. Again, it makes me think of a comfort food, mm-hmm. you know, on a cold afternoon or a cold evening. Um, I was afraid it was going to be a lot heavier than it is, which it's not. Um, so I like that one a lot. I concur. Very good. Rated? Comfort food, I'd rate it a five. Yeah, I'm giving this one a five. Four, four and a half. I mean, only because of what it's up against, but it's it's wonderful. I'm going to give this a five, and uh, I'll just have Lisa's portion then if she's not going to eat it then. It's perfect on a cold day, on a cooler day. You wouldn't want this when it's 100 degrees, but it's really, really good. And 
Yes. I mean, I'll say it too. Like when I was looking at the overall passport for Festival of the Arts, I was surprised by how rich a lot of the foods were. But as I'm out and about on these cool days, it just makes a lot more sense that they're taking advantage of, you know, of, of not feeding people in Florida heat. So that's been nice. Anyway, we, we didn't go to Italy, which sometimes has, you know, heavy pastas. I think there was a salmon there. That we, but nothing that I've eaten, because I'm trying to imagine eating this on a, on a warmer day. And again, the festival only runs till February, but nothing here felt um, heavy or, you know, I just, I, I felt really full after, like, look, we've made our way all the way around and I don't feel like so full and we've eaten 27 different things. Yeah, absolutely. So I think overall, I'd, I'd probably give this a three and a half overall. Well, whole, yeah. As a, yeah, I'd agree. Yeah, I think that's about right. Would you come back and get any of those again? I'd have the risotto again. Yeah, the risotto. Sure. Yeah, absolutely the risotto. I only wish it was a bigger portion size on that one. Yeah, welcome to my world. I'm, I always wish that everything's a bigger portion. Um, all right, so we only have a couple more uh, left to go. I think we're going to be able to do this. Are you going to have that? Or do you want me to? Is that the drink here? So we just walked a few uh, paces past the refreshment port. To deconstruct a disc, which is familiar foods with a creative twist. And I believe Lisa went, we're getting everything, right? <laughs> because they had a de- deconstructed Reuben with shredded corned beef, Thousand Island dressing, pickled red cabbage, and a rye curl. A deconstructed BLT with crispy pork belly, tomato jam, soft poached egg. Deconstructed strawberry cheesecake, New York style cheesecake, fresh Florida strawberries, sugar cookies, and micro basil. A deconstructed breakfast... Ay, a twining spiced apple chai tea shake with cream bourbon garnished with a waffle crisp and candied bacon. And they also have one that is non-alcoholic and a pop artsicle, a red, white, and blue frozen slushy. Uh, these all come in between $6 and $6.75. Um, is, is, the, is the consensus we getting them all? Well, this is one I was most excited about before I left home. Okay. Um, Which one about it? The Reuben and the BLT were the two that I was eyeing up. You had me at bacon. Well, I guess we have to get all three then. <laughs> Wait, when I say all three, were you disappointed that I didn't say all six? <laughs> you looked at me like, three? Where did you learn how to count, Mangello? Which one? <laughs> Which one was the, what else were you looking at? No, I mean, I think we were all interested in different ones up top. Like, I, I really, really want to try the BLT, but I would love to try the other two as well. So, and, you know, who could go wrong with bacon and... We might have to try one of those deconstructed breakfast thingies. By the way, audio tours are still on sale for just $10 each. <laughs> Don't judge me. Um, I won't, I promise. But I would like a deconstructed Reuben, please. Okay. And a deconstructed BLT, please. Got it. And a deconstructed strawberry cheesecake, please. Got it. And that's it. Why would I judge you for that? Look at me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're sharing these? Oh, then I'll be... Okay. All right, so before we even dig into any of these things, first things first, presentation's beautiful. Um, Kenneth is digging into the... He said, let's do breakfast first because the BLT is a slab of crispy pork belly tomato jam with a soft poached egg. I think you have to, I think you have to break that egg. Yeah, it's going to run. Oh, look at that. That's all right with that? Yeah. Oh, it's not. Oh, it's, it's, over, it's, no, it's over... What are you... Oh, it's like soft. It's like a medium... Medium soft. Medium. Yeah. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And don't pull that like what you did before, which I can only cut it into three pieces. There's clearly enough for... I mean, that, that's a big piece of... Uh, pork belly. Pork belly on yeah. there, yeah. I so want that little burnt piece right there at the end. Yeah. We call that oh. in the South, we call that outside brown. I'll go outside brown all day. That's a barbecue turn. With a little bit of egg and that tomato jam on top. Who daddy? Right. That piece right there is weighty. That's got, oh, hello, sister. It weighs like six pounds. Mmm. Don't eat that. Stop what you're doing. Don't eat, don't eat it. I'm going to try it's that. Poisonous. It's poisonous. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm going to fall on the sword for you guys. <laughs> oh, my God. Holy. That is... 
that is a must do. Wow. Definitely the richest piece of food mm-hmm. we've had today. It's so good. I just hit the table. I literally hit the table. <laughs> you hit the table and ran away. <laughs> What was that you were saying about heavy to, food, Lisa? I needed to process Did we change your mind? Yeah. So, you know what? It's, um, it's, I don't want to say that it's, it's not heavy. It's, it's, Rich. yeah, it's substantive. I mean, it's, it's just a giant piece of fatty meat with that crisp, what do you call it? The brown edge? Outside brown? Whatever. <laughs> it's just made of jam. And that egg right on top, that's, um, and I don't even know what that little, Puree slab is off to the side too. Avocado, it was good. That's what it was. And I am not a fatty anything eater. Like if that that's a major turn off for me with um, with with meats. And I tend not to like the forty the the fatty porks that are served throughout the festival. That was phenomenal. And that tomato jam on top gave it a little bit of sweetness. And I'm I'm always impressed when somebody can mass produce a po- perfectly poached egg. That was yeah. That, that was egg was nice. It was just sort of jiggly up on top, and then you broke it. Um, and it was sort of, medium yeah, cook medium. Um, and I think the, f- the fatty part wasn't off-putting because it was well-cooked. Um, so it, it, I think it was a textural thing, but I thought that was phenomenal. Yeah, that soft poached egg, I was expecting it to really leak all over when uh, Kenneth cut it. And, uh, no, it was amazing. And it's a, you, that's a really big piece of pork belly you got, too. Mm-hmm. That was, yeah, it was delicious. Fives all around? Fives all, Fives all around. around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the um, the deconstructed Reuben, I love the presentation. It looks like a pile of shredded corned beef that's going through a Stargate. Um, <laughs> right? Like, that's exactly what it is. It's going through some interdimensional portal. There you go. But it's a lot of meat. It's, it's a, a lot of meat there. That's like a full-on sandwich size yeah. slab of meat. And I was surprised because there's... More meat on this than what's displayed in the picture. Mm-hmm. Usually, it's the other way around. Um, so I don't remember what the prices on these were. Let me just see if I can find. Uh, it's, okay, so they're six seventy-five and six fifty each. That's a great value. Which is a yeah. That's a, great that's value. a really good value. Um, they could actually sell serve this in Pandora and would fit right in. <laughs> <laughs> it would take a long time for them to prepare it because they put a lot of time into putting each dollop of. I'm guessing that's mustard. But I love that little pickled red cabbage. So just grab your fork, folks, so and just take it. Stargate thing, is it like a little pastry? Yeah, so that's a, a, um, is that it's rye? a rye. Right? It's, a, it's a rye curl. It has to be for a ribbon, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. Get some of the pickled cabbage. Yeah. And if you're a purist, this doesn't have sauerkraut, right? But the pickled cabbage. The pickled cabbage is really good. As I'd it's, rather have it that way. It's got a nice little bit of sweetness to it. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's delicious. That's really good. It's juicy. It's super, super tender, too. And look how much meat there is here. It's a very it's a very nice, generous portion on this. Yeah. Thing. And especially for the price you're paying. Mm-hmm. Nothing like a big mound of salty meat. <laughs> it's great. So it's very salty. It's very good. Very good. That, that corned beef is awesome. But that's where I think the pickled cabbage. That's it. Yep. It's a nice mustard too. Mm-hmm. Where where does this rank on your number scale? I mean, you can get. I mean, they're yeah. two for two with me. Both of these are fives. I'm a, I'm a, I mean, I'm a four on this. It's it's excellent, but it's you know it's it's not the best thing I've eaten today. I give it a four. Well, that's fine, Lisa. I mean, I wasn't <laughs> a five on the sushi, but for me, this is my five. Sometimes you get one, some wrong. That's okay, Lisa. We, we understand. Yeah. All right, good. You guys broke apart the Stargate, so now I can try it with a little bit of this rye crisp. Mm-hmm. I have to bring my wife back for this. She loves Rubens. I believe this will be her favorite. That's a, that's a good four and a half right there. Um, all right. Now dig into the, your, your deconstructed strawberry cheesecake, which, again, I'll post photos um, on the WW Radio website. But it, it's broken down into uh, three or four little triangular sugar cookies, the New York, the whipped New York cheesecake in the middle, and then some fresh strawberries. It's 
it's really good. Yeah, that's some creamy. It's not quite the the firmness of a of a cheesecake. Mm-hmm. It almost has like a whipped, like an not an icing, but almost an icing consistency. And that's yeah, it says whip. It's whipped New York cheesecake. But it's so. but it's the cheap. But it's that cheesecake, you know, ingredient and taste. And it, yeah, that's. It has fantastic. a really nice flavor to it. Yeah, it's not overly sweet either. It does. The the fact that it's whipped almost makes it taste like a custard, mm-hmm. like a creme brulee without the. Um, but not super sweet, not overpoweringly yeah. And I love the fresh strawberries with it. Yeah, I was expecting this to be more sweet than what it actually is, which is a good thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the um, the cookie, quote unquote, that, that comes with it, that's I guess supposed to be the, the crust part of the deconstructed, is, is a little softer than you expect it to be, um, and also not as overwhelmingly sweet. So, yeah, it's that's great. It's really really good. Number. I mean, as desserts go, like a four and a half. I think this is another five. I think it's actually past the uh, rice cake for me, and yeah. and even the. Uh, so you give this. So you give deconstructed fives across the board. Five across the board. Excellent. I'm going to on presentation give this one a five, but on the actual uh, flavor and value, I'm probably going to go a four on it. Um, I preferred the uh, the, the yeah the moon cake better. I'm measuring everything against that moon cake. It's hard. It's hard to not measure against that one. I almost forgot about the mooncake. Yeah. I think we oh. need another one of those. <laughs> oh, my God. China's so far away. This is tasting better than that did, but it's been so long. I, don't, I just don't know. We probably need another one. I definitely think that the in the 6 to 675 range, especially the, the two savory dishes, are great value. Yeah. I think there's a lot of food. I mean, this um, this Reuben is a lot for one person. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I would give it... Deconstructed gets a 5. Yeah. That's really good. I'm pleasantly surprised. We're down to the last couple, aren't we? We are. Can you make any? Uh, can you guys? It's sad. It, it's sad, but this is good. This is like a reconnaissance mission. So next time we know exactly what to hit. And we have a couple left. We have a, we have, we have a few left to come back for another right. day. It's America. We missed America and, and Italy. Morocco. Oh, that's right. But um. Yeah, it, it speaks volumes that after eating everything that we've eaten right now, I could absolutely down a mooncake right now. <laughs> like, that sounds so good. <laughs> or take a nap. One of the two. All right, onward to our uh, to our last two, and then we will we will wrap up and start thinking about, you know, what are your maybe top three, three not thirty three, top three must dos at Festival of the Arts. Yeah. So we just waddled our way past the expression session, which is a giant, probably 40 foot long, maybe five, six feet tall mosaic where you can come in and you get a paintbrush and a, uh, a palette of paint. So Lisa, you did this with your kids, yeah. the expression session. Yeah. You get a paintbrush and like a small palette of paint and a number to go paint. Yeah, they give you like a little cup of whatever color paint you're assigned and one of those little sponge brushes. And they ask you to paint, I think they're saying seven or more squares. And everybody comes, it kind of comes in and it's kind of a crowdsourced paint by number that takes shape over the course of the day. And then um, as you're leaving, you can see they're giving, they give you a postcard to take home that's, you know, whatever the day's mural is, which is nice. I know my kids got one of the monorail that they were excited about. And the mural changes every week. Or is it every few days? It seems to be every few days. Um, I, it looks a lot less done to me than it did yesterday. I think they must have fi- finished a figment mural yesterday, and now they're doing the next one. I, ca- I can't tell how often they're changing it out, but it's definitely actively being painted each day. And again, it's nice. It's easy. It's free. There's no line to it. And it gives, especially kids, you know, it gives them something to do, something fun to do. Um, Decadent Delights is a uh, series of beautiful desserts designed with artists in mind. There is a white chocolate and purple sweet potato mousse with caramel coconut and maple meringue at six fifty. A s'mores tart, a chocolate caramel mousse bar with flavored meringue kisses and passion fruit sauce, and the artist palette jumbo chocolate chip cookie, which is a, a basically a giant chocolate chip cookie um, that made to look like an artist palette. Um, that you can paint, and then there's a number of um, sweet uh, ports and, and stouts and moscatos as well. Have you guys had any of these desserts at all? No, I haven't had any of them. Is anything, because um, we have one more kiosk to go, is anything here jumping out at you, or 
I'm not a huge chocolate eater, personally. Um, I mean, if somebody wanted to try something, I'd, I'd take a taste. But um, we're just feeling a little more selective at this point. Yeah, I think I want to just give myself a little bit of, of a buffer just in case there's something good at the last one. If I was to get anything here, it would probably be the, the white chocolate and purple sweet potato mousse. Me too. With the caramel coconut and, and maple meringue. Yeah. Um, just curious how the, the sweet potato and the coconut and stuff would play off each other. But um, let's make our way to our last kiosk. And I know the fear is starting to creep in as you have to come down to what are going to be your top three, not three-ish, top three, not actual marketplaces, but, but individual menu items. I am so full and so fat, but Pop Eats is modern cuisine inspired by modern art. There is a sous vide poulet rouge chicken roulade, which is served with apples and sage, a warm brie fondue, blueberry and beet gel, and garnished with apple and beet chips, a shrimp ceviche served with lime mint foam. Both of those are gluten-free. They're $6.50 and $6 each respectively. A uh, almond frangipane cake layered with raspberry jam and calamel. Belgian chocolate, and pop art, again, of those sugar cookies with strawberry fillings. Uh, There's also some sparkling wine and a popping bubbles cocktail. Has anybody tried these yet? I had the the chicken with apple sage. It was delicious. Um, Again, it had that comfort food element to it. I do remember, too, the portion I had, it was, again, a really huge portion for $6.50. Um... Is anything jumping out at you, or have you hit the uh, the food wall? What I am finding interesting with this is how it's a modern cuisine inspired by modern art. And everything on this menu, on the top half of the menu, is either gluten-free or vegetarian, which kind of speaks for what our mm. society is like today, being modern in a more modern you know area. And we were saying earlier, too, about how much more accessible the festivals are in terms of items on the menu that you don't have to go and, and make a special request for, but that are uh, gluten-free or vegetarian and again because everything is made fresh and that, that's another point that we should make too is mm-hmm. these aren't sort of pre-made and then you're just sort of picking up every one is assembled um, uh, as you order it so uh, nothing feels like it's been sitting there which sometimes you get at some of the bigger festivals because just of the volume uh, but you're right I, I didn't realize again the gluten free and vegetarian here anything jumping out at you? You know, I've, I've never had any of it. Uh, typically, I would stay away from a sous vide preparation, but you said that one's good, and the shrimp ceviche sounds good as well. Um, all food sounds good to me. <laughs> You're a machine. Look at you go, man. Um, I mean, we've, we've eaten a lot, um, so that chicken sounds amazing, but another heavy... I'm not, I'm not feeling comfort food. <laughs> At the moment, um, I mean, I would love the, the ceviche. I'm sure is lovely. Um, the frangipan is something that I've been interested in, just because those flavors in a cake tend to be something I like a lot. But um, again, we've we've eaten quite a lot as we've made our way around. So I'm going to leave it up to everyone else. I uh, I have actually hit the food wall, but if there's something you want to try, it's up to you. yeah, we're good. Because I'm afraid that if I get it. Yeah, I won't write it. My, my review of it is not going to be yeah. accurate Fair. because, yeah, I'm just so um, so full from everything else. So why don't we just grab a seat um, and and by seat, I mean preferably a place with a couch and blankets. Now, the way we approach the Festival of the Arts today, kids, don't try this at home. This We are trained professionals. I don't necessarily recommend trying to hit every single kiosk in one day, although I understand if you're on vacation, that might be all that you have, which is part of the reason why we did a, uh, a preliminary review for you to maybe point out some of the things that we felt were highlights to help you um, so you're not waddling out of Epcot the way we are about to be. Um, what were... Uh, what were maybe your top three or your top one or two or your your best savory and sweet uh, items that you found at this year's festival? Um, so my top three were the um, obviously the trashi sushi in Japan is an is an easy an easy um, home run for me. Um, the red wine braised beef short rib um, in Germany, the cuisine classique stand, um, was another 
another winner for me. That Corvina was great too, but the short rib was 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 number one there. And then um, I've got to say that mooncake in China was wonderful. Um, and, and such a nice surprise. My honorable mention is the deconstructed BLT, for sure. Um, but those are my top three plus one. Yeah. Can I? Yeah, I think the best piece of food that I put in my mouth today was obviously the red wine braised short rib over in Germany. Um, but it, a very close second would be that big piece of pork belly, which was the deconstructed BLT. That was Both of those were delicious. Um, my favorite dessert was probably the deconstructed cheesecake, but a very close second to that, and I might even rate it higher because it was such an unexpected hidden gem, would be uh, the moon cake over in China. Stan Solo? Yeah, I'm having a hard time deciding between the two deconstructed dishes, the deconstructed Reuben and deconstructed BLT, so I'm going to make those two my one and two. And then the braised short ribs would be my, my number three. And the honorable mention to the rice with the uh, wild mushrooms. And as far as desserts go, yeah, I have to agree, the coconut panda rice cake was such a pleasant surprise. It was, it was a, it's something you have to check out when you come here. Well, the interesting and I think nice thing, and I think telling thing, is that there's a lot of overlap on our lists. Um, the offerings in Japan were my favorite. Um, far and away. I was just impressed with every aspect of the um, Takumi table. The the Chirashi Sushi probably is my favorite item overall in terms of quality and presentation. Uh, you get that little um, tapioca pudding dessert with it. I, even we wanted to take the plate home. If you want to talk about the... Um, again, we didn't have a lot of the paired beers or cocktails or wines, but that sake and again that collectible thing was, was I just overall I think it was just a, an excellent excellent experience. I, I have to agree with you guys on the short ribs in Germany. All that fish was delicious too, and the right the 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 mooncake in China. Again, it was not overly sweet. Um, it wasn't heavy. It had a, a very unusual but um, delicious flavor to it. And I think all the things that we picked, too, for the most part, were also great values. Um, there, there's definitely a spectrum in terms of uh, not, not quality but amount of food that you get for certain price points. Um, some things, I think, were, were certainly better values than others. Um, but I think those, all those, you know, and Stan's not a, a sushi guy, and he even liked Japan. Um, so I think that's that's I think Japan and Germany, yeah. Great value. Yeah. That was incredible value. And that smoked salmon tartare with the little caviar on top was something yeah. special too. Yeah, and there was nothing that I found that was really super. Oh, the pork belly was good too. I forgot about that. It was sold nine minutes ago. Um, and, and don't forget what we started off with those little appetizers of the. Uh, oh, how do we forget the croissant donuts, croissant too? Donuts. Okay, so day one, this would be my top three, and then I'll have a day two top three and I think that's why like at the end of the day we you just we've been eating so much that we forget and um, I think some of the later things maybe suffer because we were so impressed with stuff early on um, so overall how does this how does this festival rank for you do you like having these festivals would you rather have let me ask you this do you like having these individual themed festivals or would you prefer just to have marketplace kiosks out on the promenade all year long I like the, I mean, especially being a local, I think having the, you know, the changes and the different themes and, um, you know, and menu offerings throughout the year is great. I think it, you know, it, it keeps the, the chefs being inventive. I'm sure it's challenging for them, um, you know, to come up with, with new things that are sort of a good mix of authentic and, 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 and nouveau um, throughout the course of the year. But no, we, I, I love the different festivals. Um, you know, it, it definitely keeps the park more crowded than some of us might be used to, but um but it's worth it. It's worth it. Yeah, I'd agree. I really like the theme festivals. And, you know, being here today, I realized at several points, I like this one better than any of the others, including food and wine. I think what I love about this is it, it is a much more family-friendly environment than food and wine would be with the crowds and a lot more drinking going on. Um, but this one had a lot more opportunity to engage children and um, the crowds were thinner, and there weren't as many kiosks. I really liked the pace of this one. 
and I can kind of speak for the people that don't come out as often as they would like, then that if you come out only in the summer and you're only here for food and wine, it, it's a nice change to, you know, I know it's hard when you have your kids in school to get out, to come out in January for something like this, but it's, it's something special. It's a bonus to your vacation if you can make it out during this time, and whether it's Flower Garden, Food and Wine, or the Festival of the Arts. It's, uh, it's, a, it's like an add to, to your vacation. Yeah, what I like about this one, Kenneth, to your point, is I think it is very, very family-friendly. I like the fact that there is a lot more, not just to see, but to do in terms of interactivity, no longer just sort of passive viewing experiences. There's stuff for kids to do, adults to do. Um, you know, even for kids, if, if mom and dad want to walk around and eat and have some cocktails... They can do the scavenger hunts. They can do some of the mosaic. They can do, you know, they can run around with their past. Yeah, they can do the rubs. They can try and get the stickers. So it becomes um, equally fun for them as it does the parents. I think what we're going to see from here, I expect to bleed over into Flower and Garden, which is coming up next, in terms of um, enhancing some of what they are already doing there. Uh, I love Flower and Garden because I think it's visually, it's just such a, a beautiful time of year to be here and I love what the, what they do with the plantings I was talking to um, one of the horticulture managers about some of the things that are going to be coming this year I'm excited to see that but I think this is I think Festival of the Arts if, if something you've never done before even if you don't consider yourself a patron of the arts you don't care about the Broadway stuff it, I think you will be pleasantly surprised I think that's what this is full of I think there's a lot of, of neat little surprises here both culinary and otherwise and again we haven't even you know, really talked about or shared some of the other entertainment that goes on here as well. So I think what the Festival of the Arts gives you is a full day, day and a half in Epcot without even having to ride a single attraction. Um, and I think that speaks volumes about this. So I appreciate you guys um, spending and sharing the day with me. I couldn't have done it without you. I mean, I could have. I just would have eaten a whole lot more. But uh, it has been a ton of fun. So Lisa Donato Glasner, Kenneth Johnson, Stan Solo from, uh, from Canada. I want to thank you guys once again. And if Japan wasn't so far away, I could almost do another little Tarashi. It's, it's so light. <laughs> we could definitely do it. <laughs> Get a mooncake on the way for energy. Yeah. If they had a pavilion, like if they took a section of the Odyssey or Imagination and they had a pavilion where for like $10 an hour you could go in and take a nap during Festival of the Arts. Oh my. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Would you be down with that? Yes. A buddy of mine thought of that years ago. He's like, we call. It, he's like, let's just take upstairs of Epcot and we'll call it the Dream Zone, and it's just lots of blankets and pillows and couches. I'm like, I'm all over that. I'd, what the I would. BBC Lounge looks yeah. like right now. <laughs> I would fast pass that. There's your idea for the Japan Pavilion. Have a little hotel with the little cubicles. Stay tuned for what's coming to the Japan Pavilion. Cover all you care to enjoy on the food booth. Oh for my sure. gosh, they would they would lose so much money on us. Time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week, where I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World's history or see how well you pay attention to the details, sometimes in what you see, sometimes in what you hear. If you think you know the answer, you can enter via our online form for a chance to win a Disney prize package. Before we get to this week's question, we're going to go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week, we were talking about the Maharaja Jungle Trek, I think an often overlooked, yet one of my favorite attractions in not just Disney's Animal Kingdom, but really all of the Disney World parks. There, on this sort of self-guided walking tour, you can see so many different animals that are native to Southeast Asia. There's bats and tigers and Komodo dragons, lots of exotic birds. But your question last week was to tell me, what about Maharaja itself? Because Maharaja is a Sanskrit title that means what? Thanks to all of you who entered and for some of the very creative and funny entries. Again, you were last week you were playing for my 102 Ways to Save Money book, all seven of my virtual audio walking tours of the Magic Kingdom, both of which still on sale, $10 each at the WW Radio shop. The WW Radio Magic Band cover, some stickers, a pop socket for your phone, and a mystery prize 
which, spoiler alert, may or may not contain some fun Star Wars goodies. Anyway, I took all of the correct entries, randomly selected one, and last week's winner is Jeff Espinoza. So, Jeff, congratulations. I have your shipping app information because you did use the online form. If you played last week and didn't win, don't worry about it because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So I was thinking this week about celebrity cameos in so many Walt Disney World attractions, current, some that are extinct. And one of my favorites was Tim Curry in the extraterrestrial alien encounter, where he took on the role of the excess robot known as Sir or Simulated Intelligence Robotics. Now, he actually was not the first to voice that robot. In fact, he replaced an actor in the role of Sir after the attraction was closed for a refurb not long after it first opened in Walt Disney World. So that's your question this week. Tell me, what actor did Tim Curry replace as the role of Sir in the extraterrestrial alien encounter in Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom? You have until Sunday, February 11th, to go to www.radio.com, click on this week's podcast, There you'll find the online entry form, and again, you're going to play for the book, the audio tours, the Magic Man cover, the stickers, the pop socket, which is not available in stores, and I'm going to give you another mystery prize, so good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in this and every week. I'd love to keep the conversation going, not just about Festival of the Arts or your favorite festivals and Epcot or throughout Walt Disney World, but anything that you want to talk about in the Disney World. So please come by Facebook, join the WW Radio group, go to www.radio.com slash box people. This group is for you and the content is by you. So you can not just talk about this week's show or other WW Radio shows, but anything, like I said, that you want to talk about in the Disney World. Also, be sure and join me every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. You can watch in the Box People group or at Facebook.com slash WW Radio. I do a live video broadcast and chat where you can really be part of the conversation, whether it's from my home studio or out and about in Walt Disney World. Also, stay tuned as I'll be posting some new Snack of the Week and Disney in a Minute videos coming back again to Facebook. You can also connect with me on other social net- networks. I am at Lou Mangiello on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and Twitter. Of course, I want these conversations to be two-way, so if you have a question that maybe you want me to answer on the air, you can email lou at www.radio.com, or better yet, be heard on the air, call the voicemail at 407-900-9391 with a question, a comment, or just a hello from the parks. And of course, as much as I love connecting with you online, I believe that nothing beats a handshake and a hug. That is why for 10 years, I continue to do monthly meetups in Walt Disney World, The next is going to be on Princess Marathon Weekend. That's going to be Saturday, February 24th. There's no better way to celebrate your run or that you didn't run by having a meet of the month. And of course, it has to involve and revolve around food. So we're going to meet Saturday, February 24th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. at the Daily Poutine in Disney Springs. I'm also going to be doing some other meetups on the road, including March 1st in San Diego. I'll be out speaking at Social Media Marketing World. So if you're in the San Diego area, stay tuned as I'll have information about a meetup that I'm going to be doing with some other speakers that night in San Diego. And yes, we actually have, I think, one still day one cabin remaining for our Alaska 2018 cruise, June 18th through the 25th. For more information, visit www.radio.com slash Alaska 18. Also, if you're in the Orlando area, I will be the closing keynote speaker at PodFest February 8th through the 11th. So that's the end of this week at the Wyndham Orlando. You can find out more by visiting lumangelo.com slash PodFest. And if I can maybe come to speak to your event, to your conference or to your business or work with you one-on-one to help you turn what you love into what you do, you can find out more by visiting lumangelo.com. Thanks, as always, to Mouse Fan Travel, my official and recommended travel provider. No matter where you go in the Disney or other world, you can visit them at mousefantravel.com and then go to celebrationspress.com to find out how you can subscribe and order back issues of Celebrations Magazine. Quick thanks, as always, to all the members of the growing WW Radio Nation family, including some members who've been with me since the very beginning for more than two years, like Timothy Martin, Nick Slate, Brian and Brittany Becker, Katie Haynes, 
John and Elaine Tevens and Matt Rankin. I really appreciate every single one of you. And to find out how not only you can help the show, but get exclusive rewards every month, take part in our monthly scavenger hunts, group video calls, monthly care packages from Walt Disney World and more, you can visit www.radio.com slash support. And don't forget that a portion of your proceeds do go to our Dream Team project to benefit the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. And as always, my friend, and you are my friend, if you like the show, all I ask is that you please help spread the word. That's how our WW Radio family will continue to grow. So tweet out that you're listening to this week's show. Include a link. Share it, even better yet, over on Facebook. And if you can, take just 30 seconds to rate and review the show over on iTunes. Thanks to you, we have nearly 1,500 five-star reviews. I want to thank some recent reviewers like... Hama112, who says, I love this podcast. Lou has an amazing amount of knowledge of Disney, both past and present. His podcasts bring great energy and enthusiasm to whatever the topic may be. His guests only add to the enjoyment of the podcast. Lou's a great interviewer and does his homework when interviewing anyone. That comes from being a lawyer. Uh, Lou will inspire you to make the move to Disney World, and I have a show about that coming soon, and create a new life in Orlando. Ted Flint, all the way from Australia, I think that's so awesome, says, this is a fun listen. I won't even bother trying to do an Australian accent. He says, Lou transforms his love of Walt Disney World into a lively podcast with fellow Disney fans and the occasional Disney legend to discuss park news, trivia, and history. It's a great way to prepare for your first or next trip to Walt Disney World, but it's also a way to recapture the feeling of being in the parks at home. Lou's passion is evident in the content he presents and also in the community of like-minded fans he's created. Hips6257, he says, this is better than any information website. So if you have any doubts on anything, just go through Lou's library of podcasts. You're sure to find out about anything that you're looking for. The information you get from Lou is better than a brochure since it's coming from a true Disney fan. Keep up the great work, and I can't wait to hear your next 500 Thank you so much, Hips, and everybody else who has rated and reviewed the show. Again, you can search for it on iTunes or just go to www.com slash iTunes. It'll take you right there. And finally, and most importantly, I want to say thank you to you individually for taking the time to tune in, for the love and the support that you give me, whether you email, connect with me on social, or just the fact that you have listened this far. Um, I am so fortunate and grateful and mindful every single day that I am surrounded by people like you. You, by being here, have made my life so much better. And that's what you need to do too, right? You need to surround yourself with good people, the the right people, right? Seek out those people who can fan your flames and continue to make you better. And collectively, you will all be much, much happier, I promise you. And I hope that this is your best week ever. Thank you again. I'll see you next week. Hopefully, I'll see you in the box live Wednesday night. So until next time, see ya. Hi, Lou. It's Joe from Florida. I'm stuck here in Washington for a couple of years. But nonetheless, I just got done listening to your episode 453 uh, to- 10 reasons to go solo at Disney World. I know we're throwing it back a lot of episodes, but uh, this is a big one for me because I love going to Disney alone. And there are several reasons because not only can I do whatever I want, but that's the main thing. I can do whatever I want. Every time I went alone, I had a different challenge. So one trip will be how many shows can I see instead of rides or I would go and see how many, I would count out how many people have a certain attribute or trait that I'm looking for that day. Or I would just go around and slowly walk around and observe and look for things I've never seen before. I would read all the windows on top of Main Street. Or I'd go down and I'd ride all the boat rides and look for little hidden things in the background that I didn't see. It's, I could do whatever I want and I don't have to worry about pleasing other people. And that's that's one of the biggest things is because Disney is such a great place for me, and it's it's where I close myself off from the world. So I know I'm throwing it back a while, but I love the show, and I'm a huge fan. Thank you for listening. Hi, Lou. This is Erin Vieira. My daughter, Lila, and I just wanted to give you a call. Um, it's a very late call. We should have called way earlier. Um, just to tell you about a little incident, part of the reason why I love Disney 
um, back in June, we were um, at the park, Magic Kingdom. My daughter had sprained her ankle and was in a wheelchair. We were a little late getting to go see the fireworks um, because we got stuck in a haunted mansion. It was a lot of, you know, a lot of drama going on. But we couldn't find a spot to watch watch the, you know, the castle and the show. Um, my daughter was pretty upset. And then this lovely man, who I don't know if he's a listener or not, but hopefully he'll remember this and he will know how much appreciated it was, gave up his spot to let my daughter see the fireworks. Um, and, you know, and I kind of tried to protest a little. I didn't want him to give up his spot. And he just looked at me and very kindly said, this is about the kids, and she should see the fireworks. It was just one of those moments that brought tears to your eyes and made you realize that we're all this, you know, we are just in this great big community of Disney lovers, fans. Um, so just wanted to let you know that, you know, cute little story. Thanks so much for the great work. Keep it up. We love listening. Thanks. Bye. Hello, Lou Mangello. It's Gabby Loxamana from Columbia, Maryland. I sound a little odd right now because yesterday I had a surgery done on my gums. And funny enough, this does relate to Disney. Um, everyone's always complaining about how the Small World theme song just plays and plays in your head after hearing it once. But I have to tell you, yesterday as... They were doing some work in my mouth. Um, I was a little anxious, and to block out the sound of the drill and the instruments, I would sing the Small World theme song over and over in my head, um, alternating between that and the theme song from the Carousel of Progress. So Disney brightens up any moment of your day, no matter what is happening. And I just thought I would share that with everyone. Alrighty, everyone have a magical week, and I will talk to you guys later. Bye. Hey, Lou, it's Christine Morrison from Flower Town, PA. I'm calling in this morning. I have been uh, binge listening to the show since I discovered it in back in June, and I am on episode 344, which are was from 2013, uh, things that we are thankful for in Disney World. So I'm going to pull a Tim Foster here and say this is a little bit of a go with me. Um, and it might be something that, in a roundabout way, you are thankful for also. Um, I am thankful for a person who introduced me to Disney, created my love of Disney, who I see in the parks quite often, um, would call this person, and they'd be roaming around the park. This person moved to Florida to be closer to Disney, and that would be my father. Uh, he raised me on Disney. I used to watch Mickey Mouse Club and Spin and Marty, and then I can't even remember the name of it, but it was a short uh, with Annette Funicello and how she was the new girl in town, and um, it was awesome, and I loved it. Um, he introduced me to all the old movies. We used to watch Wonderful World of Disney together, and he really sparked my love of Disney. And without him, I wouldn't know you. Uh, I wouldn't know WDW Radio. I wouldn't have this awesome community that I'm a part of with the black people. And um, my dad uh, goes to Disney every year, several times a year, loves it. Every time we go, he's on in. I don't care if I have to mortgage my house. I'm going. He's been four times already this year and um, loves it. And my brother and my sister and I, all love it because of him. So that is my person that I'm thankful for at Walt Disney World. You have a wonderful week. It's a bombing 25 degrees here in Pennsylvania. Hopefully it's warmer there, but it is sunny, so I'm thankful for that. Have a great day. Bye-bye. I know what that is. Oh, oh, Sandy Plank and saw one. He called. He said it was called a uh, a butt. Oh, wow, that's a pretty big butt.